question is that the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Parramatta. Thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. It was good to hear uh, the member for Moncrief acknowledge in the first of his speeches that there are actually negative consequences for inaction. What we've heard so much from this opposition is the negative um, comment, fear-mongering, a uh, leader of the opposition that's effectively a walking stuntman going from town to town um, looking for workers to pose in front of, spreading fear about what will happen if we as a nation decide to act on climate change. Then we have the member for Moncrief collecting the media articles that result from that and reading them into the House as if there's some sort of evidence. He may as well, in fact, be reading the Liberal Party press releases. But I want to go back to something he also said, where he referred to Australia's contribution to greenhouse gases in the world and used that as a reason to not act. It's something we hear from time to time. We hear people say that Australia's contribution is less than 2 per cent, therefore we shouldn't act. And I just want to address that. Australia per head of population is, one, is the highest emitter in the world um, by quite a significant margin. When you look at it by volume, we are number 15 in the world. There are only 14 countries that emit more volume of greenhouse gases than we do. So we are well and truly a very large contributor. But more than that, when you look at the other countries that emit around the same level of greenhouse emissions as, uh, as us, which is less than 2 per cent, over 50 per cent of the emissions of the world come from countries that emit at our kind of level. So if every country that emits 2 per cent or less took the attitude that the member for Moncrief and so many on the opposition want us to take, then the action would be left to the remaining 50 per cent. That is clearly um, not a path that the world can take. Countries have to Order. act, including us. There was also statements made about Australia's um, prosperity and our reliance for that prosperity over many um, decades, in fact centuries, on fossil fuel. And that's absolutely true. Our prosperity is well and truly coupled to fossil fuel. But for me, that's the very reason why we should act. A good friend of mine, um, Donald Horne, who's passed away now, used to refer to us as the lucky country. And we were. We had the right stuff in the ground when that was the source of prosperity. And we still have that stuff in the ground and we continue to prosper through it. But for the rest of the world, over the last decade, they have been moving slowly away. The investment in clean energy now exceeds investment in fossil fuel. Last year it exceeded it. That means the rest of the world is seeking their prosperity from a, a, a technology that we are not in. In fact, uh, Donald Horne also said to me once that we, we can't afford any longer. We need to be the clever country. We can no longer afford to be reliant on the man from Snowy River. Well, we can also no longer be reliant on depending on the Snowy River scheme for our renewables. And as a nation, that is where our renewables still come from. We, we make about 8 per cent of our power from renewables, and it's still from the Tasmanian and Snowy Hydro scheme, which were, which were built many, many decades ago. So while the rest of the world is moving into new technologies, developing skills, um, developing infrastructure, um, educating um, their young, you know, skilling up their workforce in new sources of prosperity. We, as a nation, have been hanging around assuming we can continue to benefit from the old way of the world, which is fossil fuels. It's important as a nation, of course, that we acknowledge that we do prosper from that and that we use um, the um, uh, revenue raised from the sale of permits to assist that transition of our industry from the old fossil fuel um, economy to the new clean energy future. And we are doing that. And we're putting more than half the revenue raised by putting a price on carbon pollution um, to households to meet their price impacts. But the rest of it goes well and truly on supporting jobs and the transition to a clean energy future. There's a $9.2 billion jobs and competitiveness program to support jobs and encourage investment in cleaner technology. There's a $1.2 billion clean technology program to help improve energy efficiency in manufacturing and support research. There's a $1.3 billion coal sector jobs package, a $70 million coal mining abatement technology support package, the $300 million steel transformation plan. Of course, we've seen um, the opposition vote against that today, but that's on top of a $9.2 billion 
jobs and competitiveness program. We have to transition as a nation from the old fossil fuel um, economy to a new clean energy economy, and I'm incredibly um, pleased to speak in support of this today. Order. The question is that the bills, uh, that the amendments be agreed to. The honourable member for Wannan. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I rise to use this forum to speak on this carbon tax legislation after having been gagged uh, speaking on the main debate, being only allocated five minutes to talk on it, which was absolutely shameful, uh, and in particular shameful for my electorate of Wannan. The constituents of my electorate deserve better treatment than that. Uh, now, I rise tonight to talk on some particular aspects of this bill, and I'm glad that the minister is here tonight, and I hope that he is listening to what I have to say, because it goes back to a question I asked the Prime Minister about the impact that this carbon tax will have on the dairy industry. And in that question, I outlined that if Murray Goulburn or Bega or Warnable Cheese and Butter were operating in the European Union, they would basically be exempt from paying the European Union carbon tax, or the tax that they pay under their emissions trading scheme. Now, the dairy industry in Australia employs over 40,000 people and indirectly provides jobs for over 60,000 people. By not protecting our own local dairy industry, the government is putting at risk local jobs within the dairy industry because the dairy industry is trade exposed emissions intensive. It has nowhere to go to pass the costs on. They have to be passed back to the dairy farmer. Now, we have very good research which shows that an average dairy farmer will be hit with costs between $5,000 and $7,000 per dairy farm. And in, with some of the bigger dairy farms in my electorate, we're looking at costs between $10,000 to $15,000 to $20,000. Now, I asked the minister in the chamber tonight whether, if he was putting an impact on his own constituents, of $15,000 to $20,000 per farm, would he stand there and let this legislation go through? These are working dairy farming families that he is hitting with these extra costs and these extra tax. Following my question to the Prime Minister, the dairy industry, the Australian Dairy Industry Council wrote to the Prime Minister, copied it to the minister, saying, I write regarding your response to the member for one and in question time last Thursday regarding the impacts from the proposed carbon tax on the Australian dairy industry. Your response to the question infers that the likely impact, cost impacts on dairy farming families and dairy companies are being misrepresented in the current debate. The Australian Dairy Industry Council strongly rejects any inference that we have or are engaging in misrepresentation on this issue. From the very start of public discussions on climate policy, the ADIC has observed that the impacts of carbon pricing on Australian dairy farmers were likely to be significant unless appropriately structured. Carbon pricing would lead to a sharp increase in dairies key on farm energy import, electricity and the inevitable pass back of higher energy and import costs for dairy manufacturers to farm suppliers in the form of lower milk prices. This is a serious issue which will impact my electorate. We produce more milk in the South West than any other region in the country. You are directly whacking, you are directly impacting on the dairy farmers in my electorate. It is time 
that the minister got his head out of the sand, had a look at the detrimental impact this carbon tax is going to have on the dairy industry and especially on dairy farmers in my electorate. If we were in the EU, they would be exempt because they are trade exposed emissions intensive. They need the same exemption here Order. in Australia. Order. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Lyons. Is that Honourable Member for Bass. Jeff Bass from Lyons. Um, <laughs> the Gillard uh, government has developed a comprehensive plan to move to clean energy future. We, unlike those on the other side of the chamber, accept the science of climate change. The Liberal Party have been scaremongering around the country. The Leader of the Opposition, the Member for Ringer, is a risk to jobs and the economy. We need stability and a plan for the future. Our plan is to move to a market price, whilst the Liberals have the same target but prefer instead to tax working families and give to the polluters, including multinationals. That is, take from the battlers and give to the rich. Job opportunities in science and engineering and building trades will open up uh, as existing businesses move to clean energy and invest in new technologies to generate less pollution, this is a great opportunity for our country. In fact, the Climate Change Institute research paper found that about 31,000 jobs could be created in regional Australia by 2030 if the price is put on carbon and if clean energy policies are put into place. The Climate Institute Chief Executive John Connor said, we don't want to be lumbered with energy sources and jobs of the 20th century while the 21st century charges on without us. Australia generates more carbon pollution per person than any developed, any developed country including the United States. We produce significantly more pollution per person than India and China. This is a problem we can no longer ignore. The world is moving to a clean energy future and we'll, we will be at the forefront. Some constituents in my electorate have asked me why Australia has to be first. And I say, well, we were up there with universal health care, super, and uh, opening up our economy. And we need to be first uh, with the carbon as well. What I explain is that countries around the world are already taking action on climate change. 89 countries representing 80% of the global emissions and 90% of the world's economies have pledged to take action on climate change. This is a tremendous commitment. The world is shifting and accepting the science, yet those opposite continue with their criticism and scaremongering. And yes, we have all heard the, Minister for, the member for Ringer say he will rescind the carbon price if elected. He will also reverse household assistance. Um, he would prefer the, to tax Australian families and hand the money to big business. The Australian Labor Party look after the vulnerable and working people, and the Liberals will take from those least able to pay and give to the rich multinationals. We know the Liberals will cut the benefits to the vulnerable because they have form. Look at their history. They voted against jobs. Uh, that were created by the BER. What I find interesting is that the vast majority of Liberal Coalition members have not mentioned their direct action policy in this important debate. Is this because they are embarrassed about their policy? Is it because they would rather play cheap politics, uh, hoodwink the Australian public about the government's plan? Is it because they don't believe in the science and know that the Liberal Party will never actually action a policy if they do in government? This is an exciting reform. We have the support of many scientists, leaders, stakeholders. The President of the, of the European Commission, uh, Jose Barroso, welcomed the Clean Energy uh, Future Package and I quote, Australia's decision to put a price on carbon emissions is in our view an important step both environmentally and economically because it is in our European experience the most cost effective way to reduce emissions and also create great, great green business opportunities. The Uniting Church of Australia also weighed in with the Victorian Tasmanian branch welcoming the initiative. The UCA President Reverend Alistair McRae said strong swift action on climate change is needed and this is an historic moment for Australia. Dr John Hewson said this is the most important thing we can do for our nation this century. Interesting. Yet those opposite continue to play politics, play games on this critical issue. 
Tony Abbott's carbon plan would send ordinary taxpayers' money direct to the biggest polluters, costing the average household $1,300. Yet, as I mentioned before, those on the seats opposite have been deftly quiet. This is a real difference between the Labor Party and the Liberals. Labor look after the vulnerable and create jobs for the future, whilst the Liberals look after the rich. I ask those opposite to get on board, to think about Australia's future and support these bills. Order. Uh, the question is the amendments be agreed to. The honourable member for Warnham. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise again to speak on this motion because I was gagged on speaking on the, in the substantive debate on the legislation. So therefore, I am going to use this forum and I'll just advertise the fact Again, I will use various forums to keep hammering the government on this toxic tax. Uh, and I once again just say how appalled I was on behalf of my constituents that for a, a bill which is over 1,200 pages, the government saw fit to give the electorate of one and their representative only five minutes to speak on that over 1,200 page bill. I'd now like to turn to the impact that the toxic carbon tax will have on manufacturing in my electorate. And I have been pursuing the government in this place on the impact that it will have on manufacturing in my electorate. On the 3rd of March, I asked the Prime Minister. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. Portland Aluminium, located in my electorate of Wannan, directly employs 600 people. Across the country, there are 60,000 job depend, jobs dependent on the aluminium industry. Will the Prime Minister guarantee that there will be no job losses in the aluminium industry as a result of the carbon tax? And what was the answer that I got? Could I get a straight answer to that pretty straightforward question? No, I couldn't. I got, oh, let's have a go at this, let's have a go at that, but we'll do everything that we can bar answer that question. So I followed up with that and I, I asked the Treasurer, because I thought the Treasurer might be able to shed some light. I refer the Treasurer to a fact sheet from a group including the Australian Conservation Foundation, the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, Environment Victoria and Greenpeace, which claims if Alcoa's aluminium smelting did go overseas, there would be a direct environmental benefit, even if the same quantity of aluminium was produced. Does the Treasurer agree that relocating Australia's aluminium industry, including Portland Aluminium in my electorate, to countries that do not impose a tax on carbon would help reduce global emissions? Well, the Treasurer did give me a direct answer on that, but it wasn't a very expansive one. And I now know why. Both the Treasurer wouldn't expand on that and the Prime Minister was rather reluctant to go into too much detail about the impact of the carbon tax on the aluminium sector. Because when um, Alcoa presented to the Senate Select Committee inquiry into carbon tax pricing, it came out that the carbon tax will cost the company around $40 million a year. Now, this is a trade-exposed, emissions-intensive industry. It competes internationally. And yet, we are sitting here today and those opposite are quite happy that Alcoa takes a $40 million hit to their bottom line. This is Victoria's biggest export, aluminium. And on these exports, we are putting an additional cost of $40 million per annum. Now, it beggars belief that we'd be doing that to Victoria's largest manufacturer. There are other manufacturers in my electorate who are also going to be hit. And I refer to, in particular to two in Ararat, AME Systems and Gason Industries. Now, both these small manufacturers actually produce equipment which reduces emissions. Yet, what is the government doing 
to assist and to help these manufacturing businesses who are making stuff here in Australia which helps reduce emissions, they're adding to their costs. Go figure. We've got leading technology being produced out of these two businesses helping to reduce emissions, and what is their reward for it? They are going to get hit with extra costs, and in particular, extra electricity costs. This carbon tax will be bad for manufacturing in my electorate. It will be bad for manufacturing in Australia. Order. Honourable the Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I may just respond to a couple of the things that the uh, member for Wannan <coughs> has raised. Firstly, uh, shortly after the government announced the Clean Energy Future Package on July the 10th, I was at uh, Point Henry uh, Smelter Inn, uh, Victoria, with representatives of Alcoa, uh, who in fact welcomed the government's policy announcement and the fact that the government had taken into account issues that they had raised. And specifically, of course, in the aluminium industry, uh, 90, an average of 94.5 per cent of their carbon price uh, liability uh, will be offset in the first year of the scheme by the issuing of free carbon units or free permits. And along with some other important uh, changes that the government made uh, to policy uh, prior to it being announced on July the 10th, um, uh, Alcoa, I think, uh, certainly in its public commentary and in its observations to its own workforce. In fact, I spoke in the canteen with representatives of Alcoa, with a number of members of the workforce. Uh, they have indicated that their concerns have been met, and that is an important thing to place on the record, given the absurd hysteria that's just been recited by the member for Wannan. Similarly, in relation to the manufacturing sector, and the member for Wannan raised issues concerning the cost impost for small manufacturers, we've got to bear in mind here that the cost impact is in fact very modest in many businesses. Uh, the Treasury modelling, of course, indicates that the overall CPI impact is 0.7 per cent upon the introduction of the carbon price. Within that, uh, electricity is uh, modelled to rise around 10 per cent uh, for households in particular. If we just take that number and apply it to the current proportion of costs of businesses that are attributable to electricity, and uh, working with the Small Business Council and, in fact, speaking to some other businesses, including an iron foundry, the proportion of costs attributable to many businesses that relate to their electricity uh, bills is around 2 or 3 per cent of their total costs. Uh, taking that figure and applying the Treasury modelling of a price increase for electricity, you're looking in many businesses of potentially a cost in the order of 0.2 to 0.3 per cent in the costs of their business. And that, of course, is something that uh, is a manageable cost impost. And in relation to businesses uh, that are not in the trade exposed sector of the economy, it's also on a cost that can be passed through. And of course, it is the passing through of these modest cost increases that leads to the overall CPI increase. Uh, that leads to, of course, the conclusion on the part of the government to formulate a policy that will deliver assistance to households to meet those cost increases. And of course, we're delivering that in the form of increases to benefits. 1.7 per cent increase in the pension, for example, with $250 for a single pensioner to be paid up in May and June, paid in advance in May, June of next year. Uh, similarly, a payment up front to families in receipt of family tax benefits. Uh, there's a 1.7 per cent increase in, F in family tax benefits. Uh, this is the way in which the government is dealing with these things. In addition, for the manufacturing sector, uh, such as described by the uh, member for Wannan, there's an $800 million clean technology program, which is a co-contribution grant scheme to assist businesses improve their energy efficiency. And all of these issues are pertinent too to the dairy industry that's been raised by the member for Wannan. Now, Abare's analysis indicates, for example, that electricity costs are about 2.3 per cent of total farm cash costs. With the increase in electricity price, that translates to an increase in costs of around 0.23 per cent in total farm costs. Now, the government has been through these matters with the dairy industry representatives a number of times, and we don't agree with all of their calculations of the cost in post. And here is some data that is important to inject into the debate. Now, we're very mindful 
that in dairy processing in particular, for example, uh, there is a high level of electricity consumption. Uh, and in, and uh, as a consequence of that, the government has formulated a $150 million program specifically for the food processing uh, sector, which will operate in the form of a co-contribution grant uh, with dairy processors and others in the food uh, industry to assist them find efficient ways of improving uh, or reducing their electricity consumption, that is to improve their energy efficiency. And the government is committed to that. It will help the industry and in discussions I've had with the industry, it is acknowledged that that will be an important contribution. Order. You. The Honourable for one. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'm glad that the minister uh, is prepared to engage in the debate, uh, but I would say a couple of things. Firstly, when it comes to manufacturers, the costs can't be passed through. These are businesses which compete globally, so they can't pass the costs through. Otherwise, they suffer the consequences. And let's just listen to what the three manufacturing businesses say. First of all, Alcoa has confirmed that the carbon tax, along with the Australian dollar and high import costs, is imposing, and I quote, a significant threat to the future viability of both the Victorian smelters. Now, that is Alcoa. They go on to confirm that the carbon tax will cost the company around $40 million a year. I'll leave it there. Let's look at the two small manufacturers in my electorate. Mr Peter Carthew, who is the chairman and managing director of AME Systems. The carbon tax is the sort of charge against our business which we cannot recover from in an already highly price competitive marketplace. Mr Les Gayson, chairman of Gayson Industries, said that they are expecting an increase of up to 9 per cent in expenses. So that is what the business on the ground, forget about the Treasury modelling, 9 per cent in expenses. This imposes a cost on us which I don't believe is necessary or fair because it is not imposed on the imports we compete against. These additional costs will make it a lot harder. And I would invite the minister to come down to Wannan and what we could do is we could go and see these two small manufacturing businesses in Ararat. We could then go down to Warrnambool and we could meet with Murray Goulburn and Warrnambool Cheese and Butter and we could have a discussion about the direct impact on the dairy industry. We can then head to Portland and we can have a discussion there with the workers about what impact this will have, the, will have, the carbon tax will have on the aluminium sector. And I, I offer an open invitation for the minister to come down. And while we're there, we can also talk to local farmers, because I haven't got started yet on the impact it will have on other parts of the agricultural sector in my electorate. Agriculture has diversified in my electorate. We now do a lot of cropping. Modelling done on the impact of the carbon tax on a property, which um, a grain property. Uh, in Western Australia is that it will add an additional $36,000 a year in farm business costs. $36,000 a year in farm business costs. If we move to meat processing, meat processing, once again, trade exposed emissions intensive. We are looking that, that the carbon tax will mean at least another 24 to 30 cents per sheep taken off the farmer's bottom line. So we've just been through 10 years of drought and then along comes the government to hit the competitiveness of our meat industry. Sheep meat, exactly the same thing. We're looking at a 16 per cent loss to sheep meat under the carbon tax and the list goes on. So I offer to the, to the minister, to the prime minister, to any member of the government who would like to come down, talk to the farmers in the electorate of Wannon, talk to the manufacturers in the electorate of Wannon, and in particular 
talk to the dairy industry in the electorate of Wannan to see what impact this carbon tax is going to have. And I'll reiterate once again to the minister, if Murray Goulburn and Warnable Cheese and Butter operated, or Fonterra or Bega operated in Europe, they would largely be exempt under the EU scheme. And the reason why they would be exempt is because the European Union does not want carbon leakage. It does not want jobs and it does not want industry going overseas. It is a shame that the government here will not stand up for our industries, for jobs in our country and is going ahead with this standalone do-it-yourself carbon Order. tax, which is reckless. Order. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The honourable member for Newcastle. Well, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm very pleased to uh, stand tonight. Today in the chamber, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency said that the 19 bills comprising the Clean Energy Legislation and the Steel Transformation Plan Bill represent one of the most important environmental and economic reforms in this nation's history. Well, it's days like today that make the people on this side of the House proud to be members of this government, proud to be members of the Australian Labor Party. In my electorate, we've been waiting a long time and we've been preparing for a long time for this legislation. I hear so many members on the other side spread fear to do the scaremongering about the loss of jobs and the threat to the economy. Well, they defy uh, the realities of a place like Newcastle, the city I represent. A city that once was dependent on a one industry, BHP steelmaking, yet we learnt about diversification, we learnt about innovation, we learnt about uh, investing in skills and modern capital, and we learnt about the power of collaboration. So for 10 years since the location of CSIRO Energy Centre in Newcastle, we've been preparing for this legislation. We were ready in uh, 2007 when this government was elected. And since then, the capacity that has been built ex around clean energy and the fu uh, clean energy future economy exceeds $300 million. The Clean Energy Technology Centre, the Newcastle Institute of Energy and Resources, the Australian Solar Institute, the Smart Grid Smart City, wonderful things, but one thing missing, a mechanism to price carbon and increase the competitiveness of clean and renewable energy. And that's exactly what these bills do. That's why uh, today is such a wonderful day for places like Newcastle. It's uh, extremely important to know that this legislation also sustains existing industry. And I've said it before and I'll keep saying it, there is no minister who better understands how to sustain, how important it is to sustain employment, to sustain jobs in our traditional industry. So in an electorate like mine, yes, we value add to steel from Wyala. We make the steel products at One Steel. Innovation, innovative products that are used all over the, this uh, nation. We make the aluminium, and uh, at Tomago Aluminium, we're going to diversify and value add to that product as well. We make cement, and we export by volume the biggest amount of coal of anywhere in the world. But uh, under this government, there is support for every one of those industries. I, I have just been astounded by the, the willingness to listen, the willingness to respond, by this government to the needs of, of our current industry and the jobs that they create. I guess the other side has been really concerned because not only have they seen that in action, they've also seen last week the tax forum, the jobs forum, a willingness by all stakeholders to step into the future, to face with uh, a realism the challenges that confront our industry that confront our economy. A Prime Minister's task force um, has been set up to look at sustaining industry. Just like when BHP closed in Newcastle, a Prime Minister's task force was set up 
Um, and I know that <laughs> under the Gillard government, uh, this will be an extension of everything that is good that we have done in this legislation. It is always disappointing when voices that should know a lot better spread fear and untruths, misrepresenting the realities of our economy. When the Premier uh, of New South Wales, Barry O'Farrell, repeats fallacious claims that up to 13,000 people in the Hunter will lose their jobs. No, that's not true. All the modelling says job growth in the Hunter is real. When uh, Mr Baldwin, the member for Paterson, says the coal industry is doomed in Newcastle, <laughs> what rubbish. Uh, <coughs> billions of dollars of forward investment, new terminals being created uh, by three different entities. So we know that now we have finally the legislation to boost our Order. investment into the clean energy and expired. the future economy. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it was a very valiant attempt by the member opposite to defend what is the undefensible 19 carbon tax bills that will have a crushing impact on our economy and on our way of life. And I rise to speak in this consideration in detail, in particular to highlight and speak on the amendment brought forward by the Leader of the Opposition. And I do so having been gagged in the second reading speech from delivering my speech in full on the government's 19 carbon tax bills because the debate in this chamber has been guillotined by this government. And I was not the only one who has been gagged. Along with my friends and colleagues for Riverina and Wannan, I had just 20 seconds per bill to outline the concerns of my constituents in Higgins. So why is the gagging of debate so significant to the consideration in detail? Well, I'll tell you, because we learn here tonight that the government is proposing to move 48 amendments. This means that there were 48 problems that they have already identified with their bills, bills which consists of over 1,200 pages of legislation. The parliament had less than one minute per bill to consider one of the most complex changes to our economy. And that is why the Leader of the Opposition has brought forward an amendment, an amendment to defer the commencement of the carbon tax until after an election, until after the Australian people have had the opportunity to have their say, to restore faith with the Australian people, a faith that has been so cruelly and wantonly broken by this Prime Minister. As we all know, there was no mandate from the Australian people for these bills for a carbon tax. In fact, far from it, the Prime Minister gave a categorical assurance only five days, five days out from the election that there would be no carbon tax under the government that she led. The Treasurer also reinforced the government policy position by stating in his Meet the Press address well, certainly, what we rejected is this hysterical allegation somehow that we are moving towards a carbon tax. We certainly reject that. That is a direct quote. That is what the Treasurer of this country said. And again, I say there has been a cruel breach of faith with the Australian people. Now, in my second reading speech, I already spoke about the fact that here, in bringing forward these bills, we are going to be going it alone. And we're going to be going it alone in a situation where we have a very parlous global economic condition. I want to now turn to why it is that we need to support the amendment by the Leader of the Opposition to defer commencement by first looking at the government figures, the government's modelling. And we all know that the government has got problems with its figures. We know that they're pretty good at turning a $20 billion surplus into an almost $50 billion deficit. They're good at um, changing you know, no net debt to almost $107 billion of net debt. We know that they can increase the, the gross debt ceiling to $250 you know, billion. Um, you know, this government is, is not great with their figures, and that's why I want to talk about their modelling, because their modelling is very deficient when you consider um, the amendments that they had to bring forward. When they first announced their $9 billion a year tax, 
<laughs> they forgot to mention the fact that um, there was $4.3 billion over the forward estimates that the government had simply left off their model. Embarrassingly, the Treasurer tried to explain this away as a rounding error, some rounding error. As a member of the House of Representatives Standing <coughs> Committee on Economics earlier this year, we were told by the government that the floods and Cyclone Yazi, the devastation in Queensland and Victoria, was such that the government needed a new tax to raise just $1.8 billion because the impact was going to be so significant on the budget bottom line. It said that the money couldn't come from appropriations like any other disaster because the impact was so great. And yet, in their own modelling, they left off $4.3 billion. So, question number one, if the government can't get this simple fact right with their own modelling, what confidence can we possibly have that something as complex as a carbon tax can be got right? This is, again, another reason why we need to defer, defer these carbon tax bills and the proclamation of these bills until after there has been consideration Order. after an the election. The member's time has expired. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Macon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's interesting listening to members opposite, and in particular, <coughs> can I refer to those members that have referred to the impact of this legislation on industry around Australia. And I want to respond to a couple of comments made by, firstly, the member for Moncrief, who earlier on was referring to the 1.5 per cent that Australia contributes to total global emissions and the 5 per cent reduction target of um, year 2000 levels by the year 2020. And the member for Moncrief criticised that target of 5 per cent reduction on the year 2000 levels by 2020, saying that it was only 5 per cent. He conveniently neglected to say that it represents about 23 per cent on business as usual levels if we did nothing. So it is in fact quite a significant decrease in emissions by the year 2020. But here is the irony of his comments. He also neglected to point out that his own party has set themselves an equivalent target. So if you're going to come in here and criticise the target of 5 per cent reduction by the year 2020, 2020 and your own party has adopted it, what does that say about your own credibility? And can I say quite frankly, Mr Deputy Speaker, he also omitted to talk about the impact on the policies that his leader has put to this House as an alternative to achieving those targets. Because if you believe that we ought to achieve those targets, then you must have a strategy to do so. And we've heard about their strategy, and their strategy will cost households about $1,300 a year, as opposed to $9.90 or around $500 that the, the cost of, these, of this legislation is. In other words, more than twice as much. So what impact will that have on the industries and the businesses that he claims and purports to be concerned with? But I want to talk about another aspect of that which he also conveniently failed to refer to. Now, it's a fact that climate change will impact on Australia's biodiversity and our ecosystems in this country. It is a point the Minister for Climate Change has made on numerous occasions in this place. And it is such an, a serious matter that the Standing Committee on Climate Change the environment and the arts, is in fact inquiring into that very issue right now. That is the impact on climate change on Australia's biodiversity and in turn our ecosystems. And I want to quote from a statement made by the CSIRO, an organisation that I would expect would have credibility in this country, and quite rightly so. And the CSIRO says, and I'm referring specifically to the issue of Queensland. In Queensland, fisheries are likely worth more than $200 million per year, mainly through the Great Barrier Reef system, and tourism is estimated to contribute $9.2 billion and employs 222,000 people, and this was based on a Tourism Queensland report of 2006. Now, all of these industries and these ecosystems are at risk if we, as part of the global world, do nothing in respect to climate change. And so if he is genuinely concerned about the impact of this legislation on those business operators in, in Queensland, where is his concern 
when the fact is that if we do nothing, the impact on their businesses will be even greater and there will be 222,000 people whose jobs are at risk. In respect to the other point made by both he and the member for Wannan about the impact on businesses, again, they, they pretend that we are working in isolation here. They forget and conveniently ignore the fact that other countries whom, with whom we compete have had a cost on their businesses since 1990. Finland, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, Ireland and the UK have all had an indirect or direct tax system that impacts directly on industries in those countries, and you can break that down to a cost per tonne. So it is not as though we, have, we are acting in isolation, and it is not as though we are not acting on a level playing field, because in fact, since 1990, we've been acting with an advantage because we have had no, co no price per tonne on the carbon in this country. So let's be honest, when we start making comparison with what is, what, this, what is proposed in this legislation and what is occurring around the world, because the reality is that other countries, as the, as the Productivity Commission has quite rightly pointed out, 89 countries that represent 80 per cent of the global emissions and, eight, and nearly 90 per cent of the total GDP the are already acting. The time has expired. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Higgins. Thank you again, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise again to speak on this issue in the consideration in detail. And I return to the point that I was making earlier regarding <coughs> the government's very rubbery figures, the fact that it forgot $4.3 billion and then said, oops, you know, don't worry about it, it's simply a rounding error. What it demonstrates to all of us in this chamber is that the government got it wrong again on its figures and then, of course, find, found an excuse to try and make it look as though it was all meant to be. But we know that it was not meant to be. The government's default position is to tax and spend, and the carbon tax that the government has brought forward is the biggest tax and spend redistribution of wealth that we will see in our lifetime. But this is not where the government's sort of rubbery figures end. The government also forgot to factor in the $10 billion in the slush fund for the leader of the Greens to fund his pet causes and projects. Again, you know, we were led to believe that this perhaps wasn't you know, real money. And we know that the Treasurer, of course, has had problems in the past with real money. He has problems with this concept because, in opposition, he referred to the fact that a $600 a child payment was not, and I quote, real money. Well, I've got news for the Treasurer. The money is real and it comes from ordinary Australians. Now, we know that the cost of the carbon tax will be around $1.5 billion between now and 2020. It is going to cost up to a trillion dollars over the coming decades. And this is, this is despite the fact that the Prime Minister in her own speech said, the price impact of the government's plan will be modest. A trillion dollars. I would hardly call that modest. And now we come to the modelling. Only last sitting period, the Treasurer was forced to release new modelling to factor in those things that had not been factored in. Who can forget that the government modelling in the compensation arrangements that they put forward was based on $20 a tonne, when in fact it was bringing in a carbon tax with a starting price of $23 a tonne? In his most current press release on the modelling, the Treasurer acknowledged that the updated modelling co covers the main aspects of the clean energy future package on the Australian economy. Um, however, including all elements of the plan was not feasible. So he's acknowledging in his own words that, that they can't really properly fully model the impact. They either don't know or don't want us to know what the impact is going to be. And yet we, kept, we keep being reminded by the government that this is a wonderfully vital economic reform. Yet, by their own admission, they can't say what the impact is going to be, and more to the point, they can't tell us who the 500 big polluters are. We know that the supposed 500 big polluters dipped down to around about 400, went back up to 500, and yet when specifically asked to name the supposed 500 big polluters who are going to have to pay this carbon tax, they cannot detail for us who they are. Now, it's, it's fair to say that if they can't answer these fairly basic questions and if they can't get um, basic programs like 
a pink bats program right or a solar homes program of only $850 million or a $300 million greens program right, how on earth are they going to get the most complex change to the Australian economy right? We know there is one thing that they are consistent on, which is budget blowouts. We know that they are very good at wasting taxpayer money, but we will all be paying for that. Now, I'd like to also talk about another thing that the government says that is close to their heart and is very important, and that is jobs. The government's very good at talking about jobs and yet not very good at defending them. Let's analyse some of the numbers. Verso Economics recently found that for every green, supposed green job created, 3.7 jobs were lost in other areas of the economy. Spain's Ray Juan Carlos University found that for every, two point, uh, for every green job, 2.2 jobs were lost. Study after study demonstrates what we know to be correct, which is that with a carbon tax, jobs will go. Jobs will be lost. And this government says that it's a matter of pride that they defend jobs. Yet when the Prime Minister was asked to guarantee that not one job would be lost, she would not give that guarantee. Why? Why would she not give that guarantee? She would not give that guarantee because she knows the truth. The truth is the carbon tax will lead to a destruction of jobs. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for page. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've stood here and listened to the honourable member for Higgins and she talks about being guillotined. She didn't do a bad a bad fist of it tonight in speaking, you know, for had two goes and I'm sure she'll come back for some more goes. So it's just utter nonsense that we're listening to. And this amendment is only designed to delay the start of the carbon price. That's all it's designed to do. And the government cannot support this amendment. I cannot support this amendment. And the people of Page in my electorate, they want the certainty that this legislation, that this package is bringing. I've spoken to some of the people tonight and they're pleased that it's happening. And member this is the culmination, McKellar and they talk about delays. Let me tell you about delays and what's happened. This is a culmination of a debate that's been running for almost two decades. I repeat, two decades. We've seen 35 parliamentary inquiries into climate change since 1994. We've had a lot of discussion on these topics in this House already. This year alone, there's been 225 questions asked on carbon pricing and over 15 separate MPI debates, more debacles and debates, but for form's sake, I'll call them debates. The clean energy debate has taken some 33 hours. There's been 120 speakers. Again, I ask, is that being guillotined? Significantly, this has been a longer debate than the former Howard coalition government allowed for the GST, for work choices and for the sale of Telstra. Indeed, significant issues, as this one is. But mind you, it's not as if we haven't talked about this before. And it's a bit like when I listen to the opposition, it's a bit like being trapped in that movie, Groundhog Day. They just wake up, they come in here, they say the same old stuff, trot it out. At least in Groundhog Day, the lead actor woke up every day more accomplished, more informed, more intelligent. I don't see that happening on the other side. And that's what it feels like. But really, the time to act is now. That's what the government's doing. We must begin the transformation to a low carbon economy. And this transformation begins with the passage of the clean energy bills. We have to put in place the incentives for business to invest in, in the clean energy technologies that allows Australia to maintain its economic growth while cutting pollution. It's about being competitive. I'm sure the other side don't understand, the opposition don't understand. The only competition is really with the opposition leader wanting to come into this place in another position. It's about his job. But the countries that pioneer the clean technologies that will allow this decoupling to occur will be the countries that see strong and consistent economic growth through the next century. These will be the countries that will be the most competitive. That's what this is about. It's <coughs> about keeping us, <coughs> Australia, competitive. The alternative of the leader of the opposition's prescription is do 
nothing. It's pretending that climate change is not happening, heads buried totally in the sand. And it, it's about attacking the scientists who say that climate change is occurring and attacking the economists who state that a carbon price is the most efficient way of tackling the problem. Indeed, I know there are many on the opposite side in the coalition who believe that. By refusing to grapple with the challenges and opportunities of a carbon-constrained world, and that's what this clean energy package will transition us to, the Leader of the Opposition would rather see our economy stagnate and fall behind our competitors as long as his political interests are served. That's how it looks to me, and that's how it's increasingly looking to many others. Now that the Leader of the Opposition can see he won't be able to stop this important reform, he attempts to delay <coughs> it. Just get on with it. You know, it's time to just do it. It's happening. But this again betrays his inability to put the interests of the nation above his own narrow political interest. But the fact is we know that any delay to this important reform will not magically make it less costly. In fact, it will only increase the costs. And various studies have looked into the implications of delaying the introduction of a carbon price and all conclude that such delay is costly. We can't ignore them. We ignore those at our peril. In addition, Federal Treasury have consist consistently stated delaying this crucial reform will only increase the costs of separating... Order. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Higgins. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I was listening very intently to my colleague across <coughs> the chamber, the member for Page, about the importance, as she put it, of not delaying, of doing it right now because it was going to increase costs at some point in the future. Well, we know that this is simply based on false assumptions. It's based on the assumptions that there is going to be a, a global consensus on carbon tax and on emissions trading schemes. And we know for a fact that this is not where the world is going. And let me tell you, while, while there may be some, some people in PAGE who might support you in this endeavour, um, I can certainly say that there are people in Higgins who do not. And I know for a fact, because they have told me, that it is going to have a dramatic impact on their cost of living and on their way of life. In fact, I went out to speak to my electorate specifically on this issue. Just as the Prime Minister said she was going to wear out her shoe leather speaking to everybody about this, I not only talked the talk but I walked the walk. And I had a community forum in my electorate on the 27th of July and had around about 200 people turn up. People spoke there about the cost of living going up and they asked the question, what is the global environmental gain from this carbon tax? Self-funded retirees without a Commonwealth health card stated that they would be dramatically worse off. They know that they won't receive any payments from the government. They know as well that payments simply won't keep up. They know that every time that they turn on a light, every time they open a fridge, wash their clothes, turn on the air conditioner, a carbon tax is going to mean it will cost them more. This is going to affect over 285,000 Australians, many of whom are in my electorate of Higgins who have sacrificed and saved to fund themselves in their own retirement. But that night I was also particularly struck by a very sobering dilemma faced by a small businessman, Mr Errol Myman, the managing director of Timbermate Group, who manufactures and then exports a unique product to 15 countries. He said, and I quote, I make a 100% locally made product, of which 90% is my raw material, and that is from Victoria. He is already being hit by the high Australian dollar. He employs 18 people, 12 of whom are over the age of 50 years. He told the forum that the carbon tax and the 10% hike in electricity will force him to consider relocating his business overseas. He expressed concern that many of the people that he employs would find it very difficult to get another job. He asked, how do you compensate people for the loss of a job? And that is exactly the point. You can't. He went on to say in an email to me, and I quote, 
Comrade Combe, who is sitting across the chamber here tonight, refers to households, low earners and large polluters, but does no one in Labor understand the people that will be hurt the most are the low-paid workers who will lose their jobs as they become too expensive and manufacturers move overseas? Well, that is a question that this government needs to answer. On Saturday, the 18th of September, I spoke with many small businesses in my electorate of Higgins who specifically run their businesses in Cornang Road, Carnegie. The chicken shop owner told me about the impact that the increased electricity prices will have on his business. The cafe owner said that it would make it harder for him to employ people when he had to cut costs to absorb as much as he could before passing on those remaining costs to consumers. The florist spoke to me about the fact that she has never seen such bad business conditions and that the added impact of the government's carbon tax would finish many businesses off. And on and on it went. But it isn't just businesses and the people they employ and their families who are affected. It is also the services we use. I met with a not-for-profit hospital that has calculated the carbon tax will increase their electricity bills by $345,000 per year. This hospital in my electorate of Higgins receives no compensation. It is not a multinational for-profit organisation. It is not a big polluter. It simply cannot absorb this cost. It ultimately leaves, in imposing a carbon tax, to one of three outcomes for this not-for-profit hospital, either increased cost to patients, cuts to staff or both. People in business, people in the community understand the dangers of imposing a carbon tax. This government needs to understand the impact it will have, the very real impact on everyone's life Order. here in Australia. Order. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Newcastle. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, we hear from the, up the other side, <coughs> what's the hurry? What's the big need for this uh, legislation? Well, the facts in this debate are simple. Climate change is real. The evidence is overwhelming. We're already seeing the impacts of a changing climate. Human activities are triggering those changes, and we are witnessing it in the global climate. The International Energy Agency has found um, that last year greenhouse gas emissions increased by a record amount and that an estimated 30.6 gigatons of carbon were released worldwide. The IEA advised that to avoid the worst effects of global warming, we must stop short of 32 gigatons a year by 2020. Well, it's no no worth noting that even this target is uh, starting, and I quote, starting to seem impossibly optimistic. Well, we will act, and it is important to act. I also hear, why act early? We're going out before anyone else. Well, no, we're not. That's not at all true. As the minister explained today, um, that claim conveniently ignores the action that is occurring all around the world. It disregards that our national interest is to be part of that change, part of that competitive economy, with China spending 1 per cent of its GDP on renewable energy. That's a huge market. We can't afford to be left out of that. We want our slice of that. We cannot uh, ignore the fact that we are the highest uh, emitters per capita amongst developed economies. Our future prosperity does depend on us embracing change, <coughs> on embracing a cleaner carbon economy, carbon-free economy. Um, I note that uh, the minister uh, also drew, drew, drew attention to the fact that 90 countries, representing 80 per cent of global emissions and over 90 per cent of the global economy, have now made pledges to undertake Mitiga uh, mitigation action. Actually, China, I know, is, uh, is uh, intending to have a national scheme by 2015. So it is something we can't afford um, not to be part of. We're not acting early. We're acting responsibly. This also is, uh, people say, well, isn't this a great big tax on everything? And isn't this a Labor government that's uh, putting the needs of working people um, aside? Well, no, that's not right. This is a typical Labor policy. This is good Labor policy. Member for this is a Labor policy from that makes big polluters pay, 
It is a, a Labor policy that supports 90 per cent of households with any cost impacts. It supports all pensioners. It supports three million low-income families with a tax-free threshold uh, raising that from six million to eighteen from six thousand to eighteen thousand that will support over ninety per cent of households. Um, I'd like to know will the Leader of the Opposition stop those payments? Is he going to stop the checks? Is he? Is that his style? Um, possibly defying the Australian people, denying the Australian people the uh, assistance they will need. This is a Labor policy because it sustains industry. It absolutely invests into our current industry and invests into the jobs they create. It also invests in innovation in the future and it invests into the environment. I note uh, my colleague um, uh, did mention biodiversity. The impact uh, on biodiversity if we do nothing. Australia actually leads the world in loss of biodiversity. That's not mm -hmm. something we should at all be proud of. And this is some very good efforts to do something about that. Uh, I've also heard across the, the chamber, we can't afford this. This impost is terrible. I think they said that about slavery. We can't afford to get rid of slavery. We can't afford anything that prejudices our profits. And this is absolutely an argument that we hear every day from the opposition. We can't afford it. The sky will fall. The economy will be ruined. This is the economy that has been recognised internationally as one of the most strongest, resilient economies in the world. And yes, I actually um, heard the member for McKellar the opposite, will desist uh, from interjecting. Absolutely denigrate some other winners of the Euro Money um, Award. Pakistan was laughed at. Yet the, the Pakistani who won went back, a world leader went back to assist his country for two years uh, to, to improve their financial management and their economic growth. So, no, it, we won't be ruined. Order. This is the policy we need. The this question is, the is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am so pleased that so many of my New South Wales colleagues in this federal parliament are here tonight. We've got the uh, member for Parramatta and the member for Newcastle and the member for Robertson and the member for Hughes and the honourable member for McKellar as well as myself who is the member for Riverina because New South Wales people are sensible people as are everybody in this chamber and we know how vital it is that this chamber, members in this chamber support the, this amendment to the Clean Energy Bill 2011 and accompanying bills to make commencement of the carbon tax contingent on a proclamation of the next parliament. Now, almost 14 months after the Prime Minister uttered those infamous words she will live to regret, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead, Labor is about to impose the world's costliest carbon tax at a time of global economic despair. Labor is doing this without first taking it to the people of Australia. Or is it? Yes, in fact, it has already gone to the people of Australia. We've already polled members of the public, the voters of this great nation, as to what they thought of a carbon tax. The Greens' policies included a carbon tax in the lead-up to the 2010 election, and they fielded candidates in each and every one of the 150 electorates across Australia. The votes came in, and guess what? The Greens won just one seat and the other 149 electorates went to candidates who said they would not support a carbon tax. The people have already spoken. Australians resoundingly rejected a carbon tax then, and to be fair to the 12.5 million voters, Labor should do the right thing and give the people another say. Labor needs to do this because it did not listen last time at the 2010 election. The Coalition listens and acts accordingly, always. All of the Coalition's recent major policy reforms, however challenging, confronting, difficult and electorally unpopular, were put to the people to decide. These included fight back in 1993, the goods and services tax in 1998 Order. and work choices in 2007, all taken to elections. The Coalition accepted the will of the people. That Cabinet is democracy. Secretary. That is the Nationals' Liberal way. Labor ought to do the same thing with its carbon tax initiative and support this amendment and defer the introduction of the clean energy bills until the 44th <coughs> Parliament. Remember this. 
Those who back the Prime Minister do so at the behest of the unrepresentative Greens, against the express wishes of the people they purport to serve and at their own peril at the next ballot box. Voters have long memories. They will remember the great untruth they were fed before the last election. They will remember, if these 19 bills become law, the independent and Labor members who did the double cross. They will remember and they will cast their vote accordingly. Labor does not have a mandate to introduce such a job-destroying, lifestyle-changing policy. This is bad policy from a bad government getting worse by the day. The Prime Minister will be, do and say anything to stay in the lodge. She says she cares about jobs. In truth, she does. Her job and those of some, if not all, of her front bench. She cares not about many of her backbenchers because if she did, she would not be introducing legislation which will do such irreparable harm to the now strong but soon to be devastated manufacturing and mining electorates they represent. Seats once regarded as Labor heartland, which the Prime Minister, in her haste to kowtow to the rabble Order. The that is the will Greens, be heard in silence. will surely change at the next election. Here tonight is the opportunity for Labor MPs to do the right thing. Show some conviction, some fortitude and some backbone. Support this amendment. Your leader might not like it, but your constituents surely will. This carbon tax is unpopular, unnecessary, unwanted and undemocratic. The member for Lyon wants to let the market rip. He repeated the same line to me just this afternoon. But let's not rip out jobs, family incomes and hope for the future for the sake of a whim by the Greens who want a carbon tax. We hear so often from those opposite about clean energy jobs, but what are they? Where are they? The price of carbon will start at $23 per tonne, which will add to the cost of everything we do every day of our lives, yet do nothing for the environment. Even on Labor's own figures, it will rip a trillion dollars out of the national wealth over the next 40 years. It will make our businesses less competitive. It will be a $515 a year slug to Australian families, and it will cost jobs. Order. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Cunningham. I thank uh, the Deputy Speaker. And I want to take the opportunity to speak in this e in detail section of the consideration of the bills, having already spoken uh, in the second reading part of the debate, to do two particular things that have developed since I spoke on the second reading, Deputy Speaker. The first is to address the disgraceful vote today on the Steel Transformation Bill, Shame. on which the, in which Shame. those opposite who claimed to be concerned for the welfare of people in the steel industry failed to support a bill that would provide very important strategic and needed support to the steel industry. In particular, my colleague Joanna Gash, the member for Gilmore, who I could not believe was sat on the other side of the House and voted against the steel industry transformation plan. And of course, no doubt, Senator Conchetta Ferrivanti Wells in the other place. Uh, who also has an office in my area, uh, will also vote against that particular bill. Deputy Speaker, the reality is that the steel industry at this point in time needs those opposite to support this bill. And I would point out to those opposite that Member the Blue Scope, as a company themselves, have made it quite clear that the carbon tax is not the issue that they are confronting. They are confronting the international circumstances and the level of the Australian dollar. And, and I would point Order. out the that the leader, of the, the leader of the opposition took the opportunity to come to the Illawarra, go to the steelworks and make a big song and dance about the carbon price. I very much doubt, I very much doubt that he'll be back to explain to them why he led his party in voting against the bill that was before the House today. In fact, the bill was put separately, and those opposite could have supported it if they had wanted to, but still chose not to do so. Deputy Speaker, in my region, we are always at the forefront of innovating in our industries for the future. The steel industry is an important part of the story of developing the new technologies that will be needed for a cleaner energy future. We understand that, and we're working to support the steel industry. 
We also understand that other manufacturers, for example David Brown Gears in my area, who have recently got contracts to do gear work for wind farms, see the opportunities that will develop from a greener energy future. It is important, it is important to the long-term future of this country that we begin to take up the opportunities that are on offer and position ourselves for the jobs of the future in a cleaner energy future. Those opposite got this not so long ago. In every one of their contributions to this debate, they want to ignore the fact that up until the change of leadership on their side, they backed taking action on climate change through a market, through a market mechanism. And, and the, one thing, the one thing that they have perfected in this debate, Deputy Speaker, is rewriting of history, the rewriting of their own history. And in every contribution that they make, they want to pretend that this action is something that they've never agreed with. Sadly for them, sadly for them, Order. that is not the evidence the of, their own, of their own cabinet when interjecting. they were in government, as has been outlined by many in this debate. Their own cabinet in government, of which the current leader of the opposition was a member, the member supported bills, actions and policies to put a price on carbon and to introduce a market-based system to put that price in place. Now, of course, we want to rewrite history. At that point in time, they weren't saying it was a devastating outcome for jobs. No, 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 they weren't. What they were saying was it was an important new opportunity for us as a nation to move into a greener future and to find the jobs of the future. So all of that, all of the crocodile tears that we hear now, which are never backed up by action to support jobs, such as voting in support of the steel transformation plan, are absolutely, absolutely contradictory to the record of their own party and their own decisions and indeed their own government when they were in government in this country. So I would say, Deputy Speaker, that I am very, very disappointed that my colleague, the member for Gilmore, and no doubt the senator in the other place, will not vote in support of local jobs in the Illawarra. It is a real shame that they can't look beyond their own political message and support local jobs. And I express my support in the belief that this will create opportunities as well for jobs in my region and more Order. broadly across the nation. The member's time has expired. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Riverina. I want to quote a Labor politician in my, uh, my, next, my next comment. Former New South Wales Labor Premier Morris Yemmer, who was quoted on the 21st of July, summed up the feelings of many when he said, Labor's platform for re-election in 2013 is environmentally marginal, economically costly and likely to lead Labor to a historic electoral train wreck. Kaboom! That, that's, my, that's my contribution. That, that's the sound of the train wreck. And it's happening, it's happening tonight and it's going to happen into the future. One thing is sure, it won't change the world but it could change the government. Mr Yemmer said of the carbon tax to the Australian newspaper. His remarks are precisely why federal Labor needs tonight to support the amendment to the Clean Energy Bill 2011 and accompanying bills to make commencement of the carbon tax contingent of a proclamation of the next parliament. Mr Yemmer accused the Gillard government of betraying the Hawke-Keating legacy of economic reform, instead embracing the environmental policies of the Greens' agenda. Quote, we embraced economic growth and the benefits of economic growth in the Hawke-Keating era, but we're fighting this battle on the Greens' turf, not our turf. Bob Brown wants to replace the Labor Party as a major party, Mr Yemmer said. He rejected the government's view that Australia's carbon tax was similar in scope to actions being taken by other countries. Now, members opposite should listen to Mr Yemmer. He also said every day there are reports of growth and development in China. Its growth in emissions will far outstrip our total emissions. The carbon tax at best reduces the rate of increase of emissions slightly. Indeed, even the Gillard government's chief promoter of the climate debate has admitted even a global effort to cut carbon emissions would not lower temperatures for up to 1,000 years. 
Chief Climate Commissioner Professor Tim Flannery said on 25 March, if the world as a whole cut all emissions tomorrow, the average temperature of the planet's not going to drop for several hundred years, perhaps over 1,000 years. If, as Professor Flannery declared, cutting all, not merely reducing emissions, will do nothing to cool the planet, then why on earth, why on earth are we going down this path, this slippery Order. slope to the economic will be despair? Heard in silence. Indeed, I should be, Mr. De Mr Deputy Speaker, because they could learn a lot from what I'm going to tell them. This slippery slope to economic despair and job losses. This rocky road of higher electricity, <coughs> gas, fuel and grocery prices. I know, you don't, I know you mightn't care about it, but I tell you what your constituents do. Straining already stretched everyday household budgets to the limit. And all this for what? Certainly not to help the environment. A carbon tax will not lower global temperatures by one degree not lower sea levels by one millimetre. If, as the member for Melbourne so hysterically foretold in his speech in this debate, the seas are rising due to the catastrophic climate change, why is it that so many of the doomsayers are still happy to live on the ocean's edge? For every alarmist scientist after their next funding grant who will tell you we are facing dangerous climate change, I can show you a salt of the earth generational farmer who will be just as convincing with his assurances that the only thing which changes is the weather. Of droughts and flooding rains, as Dorothea McKellar put it so well. But back to Mr Yemmer, who said, and I quote, the Greens' agenda is anti-growth and anti-investment. Lower growth and lower investment leads to lower incomes and fewer jobs. New South Wales would be particularly hurt, and I hope those members from New South Wales opposite are listening to this, because Mr Yemmer said by the carbon tax in smelting steelworks and manufacturing in Western Sydney. He could have easily added agriculture, horticulture and a whole host of other worthwhile endeavours in the Riverina. Voter reaction ranges from unease and uncertainty to outright hostility, Mr Yemmer said. I went down a coal mine myself recently and all the guys I spoke to were uncertain of their futures. Mr Yemmer invite, offered Federal Labor some sound advice. We should always be standing shoulder to shoulder with steel workers and miners and factory workers before we stand shoulder to shoulder with the likes of Bob Brown and Christine Mill. To Mr Yemmer, I say hear, hear. Rest assured, we on this side will stand shoulder to shoulder with this country's hardest workers. Rest assured, we on this side will not seek to curry favour with the Greens and their economically damaging and fiscally irresponsible policies. Mr Yemmer's comments reflect the growing concern of many Labor politicians in private. So tonight those Labor backbenchers so justifiably worried about their political futures would do well to support this amendment. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And before uh, I get to the substantive uh, contribution I'd like to, to make to tonight's uh, debate about in the international linking of permits, I really have to make a comment on that uh, farcical claim of the, the member for Riverina indicating that he stands shoulder to shoulder with the hard workers in the manufacturing sector. Having voted today to make sure, having absolutely opposed a $300 million steel transformation package. You know, um, I, I think when we're, we're growing up, we get great moral advice from our parents about beware the fake friends. And that's what we've seen from the opposition, the fake friends of the working man and woman shoulder to shoulder. The only time they'd be shoulder to shoulder with you is if they're going to take something from you. Riverina. And that's what is big, the big difference between the policies on this side of the chamber and the other side of the chamber. The policies that we see the Liberal Party, the Liberal National Coalition putting together would have every household in my electorate, indeed every household in every electorate around the entire country, paying $1,300, taking it from ordinary workers with whom they will never stand shoulder to shoulder, taking $1,300 out of the pockets of ordinary people. And what do they propose to do with that, Mr Deputy Speaker, other than give it to the polluters? Now, that is the truth of the scheme that is opposed by those who oppose us this evening. The hypocrisy is rank in this place with the comments from those opposite. We've got the member for Sturt, the leader of the opposition business, saying in December 2009, when we took an admissions trading scheme to the last election, we believe in climate change action. 
They were his very words. Mr Pine, uh, sorry, the member for Sturt, I believe passionately in climate change action, he says, yet today we see them voting against a scheme that will ensure that we do respond to that climate change action. And I'm very proud as a Labor member to stand here and say that what we will be doing is making sure that as this economy undertakes a significant shift towards a clean energy future to position ourselves to take advantage of all of the new clean industries that will emerge in that new context and is emerging around the world. In contrast, we have those on the other side just poo-pooing, negative, no, 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 a strident voice of opposition to any sense of a future of our participation in that new clean economy. I want to get some facts on the on the record this evening, Mr Deputy Speaker. Australia's carbon price is going to be linked to carbon markets around the world, and that will happen from the start of the flexible price period. Now, it's important that Australians actually get some truth about what's going on, because those opposite are masters of misrepresentation of what this program that we've got um, well organised here, and it's sitting right there in all that legislation ready to bring forward. What we will be doing is allowing the reduction in carbon pollution to be pursued globally at the lowest cost. Now, the Prime Minister, I think it was today, made the point that a carbon pollution is absolutely not confined to national borders. And, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, you might be also of an age to remember a very powerful uh, visual image in the 1960s. Uh, I think it was on the front cover of Life magazine when uh, the uh, Apollo trips to the moon looked back and took pictures of the earth. We saw the blue seas, we saw the green and brown <laughs> land shapes, and we saw, Mr Deputy Speaker, we saw, Mr. Deputy Speaker that the, the entire the planet children. is in fact connected, that we all do breathe the same air. And because there are no national borders and carbon pollution is an international reality affecting the whole planet, international linking of carbon markets will allow businesses that release carbon in one country to be matched up with businesses in other countries that are able to reduce their carbon pollution at lower costs. Now, this is a very important thing, Mr Deputy Speaker, because international linking encourages action to reduce carbon pollution around the whole world. And it plays an important role in helping not just advanced economies such as ours, a very successful economy, indeed the envy of the world. Uh, it helps advanced economies also as much as developing uh, countries to adopt clean technologies. Now, this international linking will start when the flexible price comes in on the 1st of July 2015, and I look forward to making more comments about this as the evening progresses. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Australia's largest abattoir will be slugged about $3.3 million a year from the combined costs of the carbon tax and higher electricity prices when the scheme comes in, unfortunately, next year, and faces a bill of up to $9 million to cut emissions to reduce its exposure. A director of JBS Australia, John Berry, and he's a director of the company which owns Riverina Beef near Yanko between Leeton and Narandra, in, the, in my electorate has had discussions with the Gillard government over the impact of the carbon tax on the facility, which employs about 2,000 people and processes about 1,600 head of cattle over 11 shifts five days a week. At Janko, that is 500 people with more than 30,000 head of stock currently in the feedlot, which uses world's best practice in everything it does. Mr Berry warns the carbon tax will create a two-tiered meat processing industry of big abattoirs forced to pay the carbon tax without compensation and smaller operations which do not. And it will add cost to an industry which is one of the biggest employers in some rural and regional areas. JBS Australia also owns abattoirs at Dinmore, Townsville, Rockhampton and Toowoomba in Queensland, which may be above the threshold of 25,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions a year. Mr Berry summed up the feelings of many when he said the carbon tax policy had been poorly thought through and that the Yanko facility was facing an additional cost of $5 to $6 per head of cattle, which was not being borne by its domestic competitors and the big player in its key export markets. Exports make up the bulk of the company's production. Mr Berry said Yanko would be forced to pay the carbon tax an estimated $678 
$1,000 slug, while small abattoirs owned by competitors would not face the $23 a tonne price and emissions. And I need to add here too that Cargill at Wagga Wagga, now owned by Tees Australia, is also extremely worried about the introduction of a carbon tax. The industry, despite the bulk of its output being produced for export, is unlikely to receive trade-exposed industry assistance. Mr Berry has had talks with Agriculture Minister Senator Joe Ludwig and staff from Innovation Minister Senator Kim Carr's office and has invited bureaucrats from Canberra to tour a JBS Australia site. I hope he, he, wasn't, uh, he might as well not have been talking to a wall, Mr Deputy Speaker. The company has calculated that the carbon tax will cost it about $1.8 million a year and expects to pay $1.5 million in higher electricity prices, while smaller operators in the industry will not be taxed. On 30 September, I toured the JBS plant at Yanko with Mr Berry the Mayor of Leeton Shire Council, Paul Matum, and a high-level Malaysian government delegation, which was headed by Senator Major General Diato Seri Jamal Kavi Bahum, who is a minister in the Malaysian Prime Minister's department. River in a Beef is one of four JBS Swift-owned Australian abattoirs which supplies the Malaysian market with, JB with uh, halal products from Australia. The standards required are very high, but it's a good market with a lot of opportunities, um, Mr Berry said. Uh, JBS Swift represents 25 per cent of beef sold in Malaysia and more than 30 per cent in offals. The group, which consisted of JBS Swift representatives as well as 12 guests from Malaysia, were given a tour of the river and a beef plant and feedlot. Now, uh, Leeton Shire Council Paul Maiden was al also attended, and uh, he is also concerned about what effects a carbon tax could have on the local government area. Um, now, uh, it's just typical of Labor stalling tactics to consider that, that, that uh, um, to put off Mr Berry and his requests to uh, be, receive assistance from this carbon tax, putting it off knowing full well that it will not go away. This is in the year of so-called delivery and decision. That is why the amendment to the Clean Energy Bill 2011 and accompanying bills to make commencement of the carbon tax on a proclamation of the next parliament is so essential, so that people can have a say and companies such as JBS Australia can have confidence knowing that such economy-changing legislation will not simply be forced upon them in such an undemocratic and unjustifiable way. JBS does not need to be thwarted in its attempts to help our balance of payments to ensure it continues to employ hundreds of good people in my electorates and other electorates, and to ensure sustainability for the Leeton and Narandra shires. Mr Berry's concerns are echoed by National Farmers Federation President Jock Laurie, who fears that cost impacts on food processing businesses will ultimately be borne by farmers through lower farm gate prices for import competing businesses unable to recoup losses through price rises brought about by this toxic tax. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Order. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Canberra. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased once again to stand here tonight to talk about this uh, suite of bills, as I was pleased to be in this chamber earlier today when uh, this House voted on the second reading speech. Now, before I start, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to take issue with some of the comments made by the member for Riverina, and he shouldn't be surprised about that because I do tend to take issue with most things that he says in this House. Uh, but first of all, Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, he, he implored us to uh, to do the right thing. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I am doing the right thing. I am doing the right thing by supporting this suite of bills. I am a strong supporter of this suite of bills. I have been for a very long time for um, improving for a clean energy future, for introducing measures to combat climate change. I am doing the right thing, and I am, most importantly, Madam Deputy Speaker, doing the right thing by the will of the Canberra people. Most of the Canberra people that I speak to in the, on my mobile offices, when I'm out Order. door knocking, Mayor when I'm on the phone to them, silence. in the emails I get from them, when the letters I get from them, want want this legislation. They want a clean energy future for their children. They want a clean energy future for their uh, grandchildren, their children's children. They want this. I am doing the right thing. As the member of Riverina implored, I am doing the right thing by the people of Canberra. 
The member of Riverina also mentioned the fact that um, we needed to do the economically and fiscally responsible thing. This is the economically and fiscally responsible thing. This will ensure Australia's continued future prosperity. This will ensure continued jobs. It will ensure continued growth. It will ensure that Australia continues to compete in, this, uh, in the world uh, for future generations. It will ensure that this country continues to prosper in the future. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I can now come back to my speech after I've addressed those issues that um, the member for Riverina will implore, uh, implored me to do, actually. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, this week in this chamber we will see a turning point in this nation's future. It will be a week where the rhetoric and posturing will end and members will be asked to cast a vote. A vote that will decide on whether this country tackles the problem of carbon pollution. A vote on Order. deciding whether this country will embrace a clean energy future. A vote on not, or whether or not this country will ensure a prosperous future for my nieces, for my great nieces, my great nephews, for my godchildren and their godchildren. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like, in getting us to this point, now we're still not, it's still not over yet, we've still got tomorrow to come, but in getting us to this point, I particularly want to acknowledge and thank the dedicated members of the public service. Now, those opposite uh, will probably scorn the public service as well, because they have a strong tradition in doing that. They scorned them so much in 1996 that uh, they sacked tens of thousands of them and uh, sent Canberra into a recession when the rest of Australia was growing. So uh, um, it won't, wouldn't surprise me if we're going to get public service servants abused um, in the process of this debate tonight. Uh, they also scorn them. Well, they scorn them. You know, if they do uh, ever become a government, they want to sack another 12,000 public servants. I think. So uh, we can actually see what those opposite think of uh, the public service, the dedicated public servants who serve this nation fearlessly, tirelessly. They are the invisible heroes. Tonight, I want to acknowledge those invisible heroes. Tonight, I want to acknowledge and thank them for their service to this country. Madam Deputy Speaker, before I uh, came in, was elected last year, I was a consultant. I had my own business, and for about three of the years that I was consulting, just before I um, uh, was pre-selected, I actually worked in the Department of Climate Change on the CPRS. So I have seen firsthand the dedication of the public servants who work in that agency, the quality of the advice that they provide, the thankless tasks that at times they have to perform. One, I saw a man here today who was actually, I remember having a meeting with him at 9am, uh, in, uh, this was a few years ago, he just he, he had a meeting at 9am with him, he'd actually just come in to the office after spending the whole night there, the whole day there, Order. working tirelessly on um, trying to ensure a clean energy future, the a, McKellar, a, 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 a silence, solution please. to climate change. He was doing that. He'd just gone home, had a shower and come back for another full day's work after working around the clock. This was typical of the work in the department, typical of the dedication of those, pu those public services. I thank them. Order. The member's time has expired. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I'll call the member for Riverina. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, and thanks to the member for Canberra for that uh, contribution, and I invite her, like I invited the Prime Minister, to come to the River Arena and talk to the hard-working farmers, to talk to the families, to talk to the business people, to talk to all the industries who will be affected by the carbon tax that she and her Labor colleagues are going to foist upon our people. Now, I didn't get a letter back from the—I didn't get a response back from the, uh, from the Prime Minister when she said that she would wear out her shoe leather talking to people across Australia, but she certainly didn't respond when I wrote to her and said that I would invite her to come to the Riverina to wear out some of her shoe leather talking to my constituents. And I'm sure when I write to the member for Canberra, which I will do in the morning, to invite her to the Riverina, I'm sure she will respond. Uh, she may not come to the Riverina to talk to them, but I'm sure she will give me the courtesy of a response. Now, these costs and job losses from this carbon tax are going to be compounded in regional Australia and certainly so in the Riverina. And the member for Canberra will find that out if she comes, if she goes down the highway and comes out to the good people of the Riverina and talks to them about what the carbon tax will mean to them. Announcing the big new tax on 10th of July, Carbon Sunday, the Prime Minister said nine out of ten households would receive compensation. But millions of middle income families 
will be worse off. For those who will receive financial assistance, the government cannot or will not say for how long. How could anyone trust this government which is being told what to do by the Greens, being led by the nose by the Greens? How else could you explain that the PM's office allowed Senator Milne to announce the government's $3 billion renewable energy package on the 8th of July? How else could you explain that the Greens, and there are only 10 of them, of the 226 elected upper and lower house MPs, not only knew about the carbon tax but had significant input into its planning over many weeks when 103 Labor backbenchers were told about details of the tax during a teleconference only on the morning of Carbon Sunday. And that is why Labor is so divided. Professor Roscano revealed what could aptly be described as an inconvenient truth in his updated climate review report when he said Australian households will ultimately bear the full cost. In the European Union, its emissions trading scheme raised $2.6 to $2.9 billion between 2005 and 2011. The Gillard government's proposed carbon tax will raise $9 billion a year, more money in its first three months than the European scheme has raised in five and a half years. Already Gillard Labor has foreshadowed, courtesy of these bills, three new bureaucracies. Australian Renewable Energy Agency, the Climate Change Authority and a $10 billion Clean Energy Finance Corporation. We will eventually become little more than a nation of coffee drinkers and paper shufflers. Be forthright, honest and fair income. Allow the people to have their say. Your constituents deserve to have their say. They will not be silenced. At the very least, they will respect you a whole lot more for it. Now, I received an email this morning from Alan Perman from Forest Hill, which is a suburb just east of Wagga Wagga, who said, we do not want the proposed carbon tax without an election on the issue. Now, it seems that, that that's gone, Madam Deputy Speaker, but he also added, please vote against this tax or at least for a delay until after the next election. And this is what this amendment does. So I ask those members opposite, at least please defer it until the 44th parliament. At least the constituents in your electorates, maybe they were once safe, they will now be very marginally, and if the polls are anything to go by, they will be very, very marginally and very, very losable, deserve at least to have their say. Now the coalition has a, has a policy, the direct action policy, which, which is, is, is very good. Is very good. Now the Labor Greens government has no mandate to introduce the carbon tax legislation. The Prime Minister said there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. She's failed to honour her promise to the Australian people. She's failed to honour her promise to those hard-working backbenchers who are now extremely worried about their political futures. The next election will be a referendum on the carbon tax, which will drive up the cost of living for all Australian families and it will cost local jobs. The carbon tax means $9 billion a year new tax, 10 per cent hike in electricity bills in the first year alone, and on and on and on. Do the right thing, support this amendment and at least Order. do the right the thing time by your constituents. Order. The uh, question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Macon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, the opposition have run their campaign against this legislation from day one as a campaign of misinformation and fear. That's and right. what is concerning is that this is a serious matter. And as I listen to members opposite tonight make their contributions to this, in this debate, they are continuing with that campaign of misinformation and fear. And I want to refer to a Your couple next. of comments that have been made only in the last hour or so. Firstly, the member for Higgins made a reference to the climate change minister, which implied that this legislation is based on some kind of socialist or communist uh, agenda. Nothing could be further from the That's truth. Right. The issue relating to carbon science has been one that has been accepted by conservative governments around the world. And I, I referred to earlier to the, to the comments of former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher dating back 22 years. But in addition to that, you can look around what is happening in the world right now. And, Angela Merkel from Germany, David Cameron from the UK, Nicolas Sarkozy from France, John Key from New Zealand, all, well, uh, that's what the opposition would have us believe, that they are all socialists. 
The reality is that they are conservative governments who have accepted the science, as did, as did the coalition's own leaders, John Howard, Brendan Nelson and the member for Wentworth. The reality is that the carbon science on this issue is absolutely clear. And if my time permits, I will come back to that in a moment. Because what is equally disturbing yeah, is the constant implied attacks on the scientific community, not only of this country, but of credible scientists around the world. And Madam Deputy Speaker, just before I, I do come back to that, I wanted to just refer to some of the rhetoric coming from the member for Riverina and the member for Higgins, who bring into this chamber stories of people that they have spoken to and their concerns about the implications of this legislation. They don't talk about their alternative policy, right. which will cost them two and a half times as much. They don't talk about the fact that that will impact on their livelihoods and on their businesses two and a half times as much. They don't tell them that their policy would in fact reward the large polluters. They don't tell them that their policy would not achieve the 5 per cent emission reduction target by 2020, which they have committed to. And they don't tell them that their policy is entirely reliant on 60 per cent of the carbon being sequestered into our soils, which they know is unachievable. If they are going to criticise our policy, whilst at the same time commit to an emission reduction target and pretend that they accept the science on gl global emissions, then at least be honest enough to compare the two policies when you're talking That's to the people right. that approach yeah, you. Yeah. But I want to come back to the issue of questioning and challenging the scientific community, because quite frankly it does disturb me, because I personally have spoken to countless scientists both in this country and also from overseas. And I have yet to find one scientist working in the climate science field today that has, that has spoken to myself that does not accept the science. I have yet to find one academy of science around the world that refutes the science. I have yet to find one national government around the world that refutes the science. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, it seems to me, it seems to me that if, the, if um, members are going to come into this place and question the science, then they ought to be honest about their position, Don't rather than saying that's we right. question the science, yeah, but we will commit to a 5 per cent emissions reduction yeah, target yeah. By, the 20, by 2020. That is yeah, the height yeah. of hypocrisy. You can't have it both ways, either accept one position or the other. Now, Having, yeah, yeah. having said that, the rea reality is that this country has well, benefited that. from the, the work— Kingston will stop this, talking across the chamber. Madam Deputy Speaker, this country has benefited over the years from the work of our scientific community. We yeah, have benefited yeah. in incredible ways, and yet, we, and, and yet we accept their advice and their opinions when it suits us, and then we reject it and pretend oh, well, that they are order. part of some conspiracy when we don't like the advice that they are providing with us. Baby. Now, quite frankly, M Madam Deputy Speaker, that is not only absurd, it is an insult to the good men and women of this country and around the world the who are Bowman. genuinely concerned about this issue, who have devoted in some cases their life to researching this issue and who know that we ought to be acting and the sooner we start, the easier our task will become. Yeah. They, also know, they also know that if we don't act, and yes, we do have to act in conjunction with other countries, the consequences for the, for the planet and for future generations will be absolutely disastrous. Order. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the uh, amendment moved by the Leader of the Opposition, which says that the uh, bill, if it is passed, must not be made, or proclamation must not be made, until after elections have been held for the 44th Parliament and the Parliament has met. And the reason for that is very straightforward and simple. Six days prior to the election, the Prime Minister said there will be no carbon tax by any government I lead. Oh, I remember that. I remember. Uh, this is a statement that was made designed to attract votes and to say, you can trust me, I will not give you this great big tax. This was deliberately designed to allay the suspicions and fears that the Australian people had about this woman who had knifed the previous leader and usurped power, Lady Macbeth by any term. The fact of the matter is that we have rising in this parliament every day uh, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. He stands at the dispatch box and says that the opposition is running a campaign of fear. And yet the exact opposite is true. It is the government that runs a fear campaign. Let me give you an example. 
Mr Combe said and told this House, he said that a report had shown that significant risk to human health, to agriculture, to cities, to infrastructure and to natural heritage from the more severe climate impacts over the longer term. The sea levels will rise and the implication is houses will fall into the sea. And yet this same minister, when he chose to buy a house that was not in his own electorate, but on the foreshore of Newcastle, said in an interview to the Daily Telegraph dated order. the 16th Move of November, The member for Macon on a point of order. Madam Deputy Speaker, it, um, I uh, refer you to section 76 of the standing orders and ask you to bring the member back to the subject on the, uh, on the principle of relevance. Amen. Member for McKellar. We'll address the amendment. We'll the, amendment the amendment. I'm saying why it has to be the leader of the opposition. Why it needs to be <clears throat> after the election is held is because this government is running a scare campaign, which it denied it was running, and because it gave a commitment that there would be no carbon tax prior to the election. But Mr. Combe, of course, said in the interview that I mentioned that his wife had looked at a home in Charlton and the found this McKellar. place and fell in love with it. It's the very important that my wife and son are. I call the parliamentary secretary on a point of order. I'd ask that the member for McKellar direct her comments to the bill that, and the amendments that are before the House and not stray into Thank total, you. total offensive irrelevance. Thank you. The member for McKellar will continue and she will address the amendment and keep it to that. Please. Speaker, the reason that I am talking about the decision, the personal decision that, that, the, me that yeah, the minister made. The member for McKellar will resume her seat. This the is parliamentary a from the chair that the member for McKellar is now engaging in. She's disputing your ruling, De acting deputy speaker. She's now arguing the point, and you've ruled that she should not stray into this subject matter. Thank you, thank you. The member for McKellar will stick to the amendments, please. Speaking to the amendment, the amendment says that there will be no that this. Uh, uh, bill will not be proclaimed prior to an election being held. And I am making the point as the reason for that is, is that there are dishonesties coming from the opposite from the government side. And one of them is that the Minister for whatever his grand title is, climate change and energy not, efficiency. Will not go into that, will not go into that area, please. I can indeed. I can make the point as to why he is misleading the Parliament. He is misleading it because, despite saying that uh, the seas will rise and houses will fall into the sea, he chooses to buy one no, because he wants a McKellar, safe place for his family. The and McKellar that is a perfectly valid point to make. And it is the important to make. The member McKellar resume her seat. It is not just a point of order about relevance. This is now bordering on disorderly conduct, Deputy Speaker. The member for McKellar has been here long enough, well long enough. Parliamentary Secretary will resume his seat. The member for McKellar can continue but must, must address her remarks to the amendments and, I am. and not cast those kinds of uh, aspersions what on members the, of this House. Aspersions does the, does the Deputy Speaker say I'm casting? The Parliamentary Secretary. I, I take a point of order which is not just now a point of order that is directed to the complete irrelevance of the way in which I may be taking up the time of the member for McKellar, but she has been wasting the House's time with irrelevant matter and offensive and disorderly thank conduct you, and is proposing you. to con continue with it, it appears. The member's time has expired. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Kingston. Deputy Speaker, and what we see today from the opposition with their amendment is the biggest and longest dummy spit about losing election in this parliament's history. What they found is that they could not form a government, and so instead they've decided to make political opportunistic uh, 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 advances on this. And what we've seen from them is absolute hypocrisy. And the member for Macon clearly pointed that out. Within this debate, we've heard the member for McKellar talk about how the seas aren't really rising. This is all a fabrication of people's imagination. We've heard the member for Riverina dispute the science and say there's no point in acting. We shouldn't act. We shouldn't do anything about climate change. This is what those on the other side have said. They've disputed the science to say that the rest of the world's not acting, so why should we act? They've put inaccuracies, inaccuracies, inaccuracies 
policies are one after the other. In fact, if the opposition really believed that there's no merit in acting, if the opposition really believed that we should not act in terms of climate change, which is what's being advanced from the other side, then why do they have a minus 5 per cent target? Why do they want to spend $45 billion of taxpayers' money? And we heard before, we heard before that there was some concern from the opposition about this being some sort of communist, communist uh, proposition. Well, in fact, the only communist proposition put before the Australian people is the opposition's proposal. The opposition's proposal to directly have their direct action plan that has a command and control where government will choose the winners. Government will spend 46 billion dollars of taxpayer or 45 46 probably will blow out uh, probably will blow out it's a well it's a significant proportion it is well we know how much it will cost householders it will cost householders $1300 a year that's what it will cost the average household and you're going to take that and you're going to give it to the big polluters and it's going to be government direct government controlled, forget the market, forget any market principles. And as I've said before in this place, it's no wonder that the National Party lets go of their market principles. That's pretty, pretty expected from the National Party. But for the Liberal Party to forget their market principles, to say, we don't want the market, we want government intervention, is a unique thing, a unique thing, and certainly shows how they are really in this for their political, political opportunists. Now, let's get some facts on the table. And let's talk about there has been a huge fear campaign, huge fear campaign about what this bill will do in terms of cost of living. Well, let's look at the facts, not, not the fear, let's look at the facts. So let's go through the estimated costs that the price impacts on family. Per week, the impact of the carbon price, as modelled by Treasury, is less than $1 per week on average. Electricity is $3.30 per week and gas is $1.50 per week. So let's have a look at that. Dairy and related products, which have been talked about a lot, less than 10 cents a week for, those, uh, for the impact on householders. Bread and cereal products, less than 10 cents a week. Meat and seafood, around 10 cents per week impact. Fruit and vegetables, 10 cents. Non-alcoholic drinks and snack food, 10 cents per week. Meals at meal takeout and takeaway Order. foods, 20 cents a week. Other food, minus 10 percent. It does add up, Member for Bowman. It adds up to $9.90. With our compensation, with on compensation, nine out of ten families will receive assistance. Under the opposition's plan, the $46 billion that they will rip away from households, there is no compensation, no assistance, no tax cuts. In fact, the opposition will claw those back. Claw those tax, but, uh, tax concessions back. Claw it, well, you will. There's no other way. There's no other way to describe it. Now I hadn't finished here. We're still going. So men's clothing less than 10 cents a week. Women's clothing le clothing less than 10 cents a week. Children's and infants' clothing less than 10 cents a week. Footwear less than 10 cents a week, and the list goes on. This clearly demonstrates objective modelling that shows that the opposition's fear campaign is exactly that. The opposition needs to come clean about their own impact on families as well. And as I've said, it's $1,300 per year that the opposition will take from taxpayers. Every single family, ta family the taxpayers will have to pay for the subsidised polluters policy. That is an appalling policy Order. and Minutes one that completely puts Order. in the member for Kingsville will resume her seat. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for McKellar. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, I listened to the previous speaker talking about the fear campaign that me. the uh, opposition is alleged to have raised, and yet it is the fear campaign coming from the government, which is the point I was making earlier as to why we need to have an election before this legislation, which may be passed, becomes operational, and i.e. I. it is proclaimed. The government, uh, again, uh, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, stood in this parliament today and said that they were going to bring down uh, the number of millions of tonnes of uh, carbon that was emitted, and yet in their own document that they have published themselves uh, called uh, Strong Growth, Low Pollution, uh, in the summary page it shows that between 
Uh, the current levels are 2009-10. The uh, emissions that are being uh, um, emitted are 578 million tonnes, and in 2020 it will be 621 million tonnes. In other words, it will not come down, it will go up. And yet the pain being inflicted on the people is enormous. And that's why we have said that we will repeal the carbon tax laws, if they are passed in this parliament, just as the Labor Party repealed work choices. You said all along you would do so, and we say all along we will repeal it. And just as you repeal work choices, we will repeal the carbon tax. And to make it very certain, the reason we didn't need to support the steel industry plan today is because once the carbon tax is removed, it is not necessary, because the jobs will not be impacted. The bottom line is very simply that this morning the polling showed that the opposition was the party or the parties more trusted to deal with the question of climate change than the government. It also showed that we are also the parties who are more trusted to deal with the economy, to deal with interest rates, to deal with all the matters which are of importance to the Australian people. And for you people to sit there and fly in the face of the Australian people when you only got elected because you misled the people into believing you would not impose a carbon tax is hugely an insult to the Australian people. And that's why this amendment has been moved, to ensure that the Australian people can have a say. Now, if you had an ounce of decency in you, you would say that you accept that you were elected because the Prime Minister promised the people order. there would be no Moving tax. The, will resume her seat. the member for Petrie on a point of order. Uh, Point of order, um, Deputy Speaker. The member for Mackillar is reflecting on the chair by constantly saying, "You people, she should she should make sure her comments are through the chair." Thank you, thank you. The member for Mackellar has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Good try, dear. Uh, if I can say very, very strongly, no, I don't. If I can say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that there has been a tactic being uh, developed here to interrupt government opposition members, perhaps we can retaliate in a similar manner. But I, the point I make very strongly is that there is a scare campaign where the government is disingenuous about the fear-mongering it puts out about the rising seas and houses toppling into the sea, when the minister responsible has his own house on the order. coastline, and it the is perfectly in order for me to Mikhail say so. The, the, the member will resume her seat. The member for McKellar will resume her seat. The parliamentary uh, secretary. Again, the member for McKellar is engaging in disorderly conduct and right. is addressing matters which you have already ruled, acting deputy speaker, Thank are you. irrelevant to the yes. matters that are now under consideration. The Parliamentary Secretary is correct. Those remarks are not relevant to the amendments that are being debated right now. I call the member for McKellar and I ask her to address her remarks to the amendments. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This goes two ways. Well, you have sat here tonight and I have listened to irrelevancies coming out of government members again and again and not a squeak has anyone made because this is a wide-ranging debate. You have chosen, Madam Deputy Speaker, to narrow that debate and you'll have to wear the consequences of that. Now, if I can say that the point I made about scaremongering on the part of the government is because you are so disingenuous. You scare the people, and yet you choose, in your own way, to simply say that you are the only people who believe in the science. There are many scientists who disagree with the ones that agree with you, who do not get funded, who make the point that they are entitled to be funded to do their research as well. And the bottom line is this. The people are entitled to have a say before this Order. penalty is imposed Order. upon the them. The member's time has expired. I call the member for Parramatta. Ah, the final true position of the uh, front bench of the opposition comes out, that they uh, don't believe in climate change and it's all a conspiracy by nasty scientists paid by heaven knows who. What an astonishing, what an astonishing... Member McKellar on a point of order. The comments made by the member for Parramatta are not relevant to the uh, amendment that has been moved and are a reflection upon uh, comments that were made that you ruled were not in order in the debate. The member Parramatta has the call. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. My comments were about a part of the um, member for McCallum's speech, which you didn't rule on, and she knows that full well. Uh, but you know, 
If she doesn't believe in climate change, one would have to question um, her capacity to think things through, quite frankly. Yes, look, the uh, member for McKellar on a point of order. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the uh, member, when she's rising to speak to the subject matter of the amendment, must stick to the subject matter. Yes, uh, she is not entitled to put words in my mouth. She is only entitled to speak to the amendment yes. strictly. Thank you. The member for Parramatta, and I remind the member for Parramatta that she is under the same obligation to um, address her remarks to the amendments before the House. Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't need to put words in the member for McKellar's mouth. Yes, thank you. Um, the member the, for Parramatta will uh, continue. I, yes, the, the amendment today um, concerns a delay yet again, um, an attempt by the opposition yet again to delay um, action on climate change. Order. Now, the member um, for uh, Riverina course, who was speaking earlier, is quite new to this House. But the member for McKellar and many of the other people in the House have been here long enough to know the history and how long the debate on climate change has been going on. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about that. I came to this parliament in 2004, and at that stage the, the um, Labor Party um, was campaigning on signing the Kyoto Protocol. And I ran an extensive campaign in my electorate way back then in 2004 on that aspect of climate change, um, well received in my electorate and in the electorate of many of my Labor colleagues. In 2007, both sides both sides of this House, both the government and the opposition, went to the electorate promising action on climate change through a market-based mechanism. The two policies were different. The opposition policy was for a three-year fixed price, which they didn't call a tax at the time. They called it a three-year fixed price. The, opposition's, uh, the government policy at the time, um, uh, sorry, the opposition's policy was... Order. The member for McKellar. Madam Deputy Speaker, you have ruled that uh, speakers must be directly specific to the um, amendment as moved, and therefore the member has to explain why they, it should not be held up until after order. there is an election the and to give reasons why it has to be the put now. That's not what she's doing. The member for Parramatta will continue. I really am describing, Madam Deputy Speaker, the history of this and why the debate has gone on long enough and there shouldn't be a delay any further. In 2007, um, the Labor side went to the, to the election with a, um, a policy of an uh, emissions trading scheme with a one-year fixed price. During the term from 2007 up till 2009, um, when it was finally rejected in the Senate, we had a white paper, a green paper, an exposure draft debate in this House, two Senate inquiries, and the opposition of the time negotiated with the government on an outcome and agreed on it. And then overnight there was a leadership change and the opposition changed its policy after four years of consistency in this policy. And the shame of it is that we know on this side that this is a policy Order. blip. Murphy Hughes. This is a policy blip on the part of the Liberal coalition um, opposition. Once the leadership changes again, they'll revert to their natural the policy position, which, to which is to support a market mechanism as they did in 2007, 2008 and 2009. And once that happens, they will realise what a lost opportunity, what a lost opportunity um, they had in not entering in, into the debate on this. Australia is an interesting country. The Australian people tend to pick one party in the state, one party in the federal government, and a balance of power minor party in the Senate. They require us, as a government and an opposition, to work together to get our, our bills through. And every government. Every government in Australian history, with the exception perhaps of the Howard government when he had majority in the Senate, has done exactly that. The government and the opposition have worked together to find a path through. And it's the working together of both sides which causes stability in this country. It means that when governments change, we don't flip-flop from one side of the policy to the other because we've worked together to find a, a position which we can both support. You have lost an opportunity here. You have lost a real opportunity to be part of a major reform. Order. The, uh, the question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Barara. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak to the amendment moved by the Leader of the Opposition to the Clean Energy Bill. And, uh, that amendment deals with the commencement provisions, um, and he makes, the amendment makes it clear that the provisions of the Act are to commence on a date fixed by proclamation, and to a proclamation for the purposes of subsection 1 must not be made until after elections have been held for the 44th Parliament and the Parliament has met. Now, the reason for that is quite clear. Uh, it's, to, uh, it's to delay the commencement of the legislation. 
Uh, I would think that members opposite, if they were desirous of thinking about their own future, might well be disposed to supporting the amendment. Um, it's quite interesting. As I sit quietly and think about events that are occurring in the nation at the moment, uh, they are quite fascinating. In the time that I've been here, I have not seen a government that ostensibly argues uh, that it ought to be well received by the Australian community because it saved us from a global financial crisis. Uh, it's maintained unemployment levels at relatively low numbers. Um, and it argues that the Australian community ought to be grateful that they've delivered that outcome. And how is it? And how is it? How is it Braddon. that we have lost that uh, support that you might have otherwise expected that those policy prescriptions about which they boast might have delivered? Now the fact of the matter is uh, that they know they're on the nose. And the reason they're on the nose is not because of the uh, government's own policies, um, it's because they are part of a coalition with the Greens and the policy prescription has been delivered because they did that deal with the Greens. And it's very necessary uh, for the government to produce legislation that they know in their heart of hearts the Australian people do not support. Um, and I suspect that uh, if they were desirous of thinking about their own future, and look, I gather that some of them are, uh, that some are contemplating whether they ought to have a slight shift in direction. Um, and their thinking, of course, is uh, if we do shift in a slightly different direction, how might we be able to survive? And I, I think the reasoning uh, that I see coming through over and over again um, is that uh, if they did have a change in leadership, they might well be able to strike out in a new direction, to put this matter off the agenda and to be able to focus on what they believe are the positive, the positive uh, uh, arguments in support of their, uh, their own situation. Uh, so I, I must say I hope they don't see that this is a particularly unique opportunity for them to be able to get the government off the hook by voting, by voting for the Leader of the Opposition's amendment. Um, and, uh, uh, this, is an amendment, this is an amendment which is, uh, I think, uh, particularly, uh, particularly a useful opportunity for some members of the government who think they might, in their marginal seats, be able to hang on, uh, because they would get it away and, and, and off the political agenda. But, uh, th this is a, a serious matter, Madam Deputy Speaker. My view um, very clearly is that uh, the uh, way in which the government is proceeding with this matter in advance of the rest of the world um, leaves us seriously exposed. I've recently travelled to the United States. I've had the opportunity of talking to a number of um, uh, people who are very interested in public life in the United States of America. Uh, this is not a matter that is on their agenda. Um, this, this matter has largely been driven uh, off the public agenda in the United States because of the other serious issues that confront their economy. Um, the government argues, well, we know they're not going to deal with it nationally, um, but hopefully some of the states are. But it's very interesting, Madam Deputy Speaker. You know, one of the signposts was the Chicago Exchange, um, the carbon exchange. Even that has closed. Um, there is little prospect that the United States is going to buy onto the sort of agenda that we're buying onto here, and with so other, few other countries buying on, this is going to leave us dangerously exposed. Any claims that the government has delivered us a reasonable standard of living will be quickly lost in a uh, in a situation where we become even less competitive uh, in Order. a very competitive the world. Time has expired. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Chifley. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Barara. Often you have to pay to see acts of contortion, uh, and uh, tonight we got one for free. Uh, because that twisted logic that said to us that we needed to accept their idea or their proposition of an amendment to save ourselves uh, is, is something else. The, the, issue, the issue that we are being asked to do is to delay action, and that we, through that, 
uh, would provide some benefit, when the reality is that by every year we have delayed acting in trying to meet a bipartisan target of cutting emissions by 5 per cent uh, by 2020, from 2015, $5 billion in cost that we would have to engage in to catch up to make that target. And we are being asked to delay action and, in effect, assume huge costs uh, in the process. Um, we are being told, for example, and tonight we were, um, we were chastised, uh, I'd put it, that we were engaging in a scare campaign by relating fact. Fact that the Climate Commission, in its report, Order. The Critical Decade, had outlined clearly the type of impacts that will come about as a result of worsening climate change as it relates to Australia, where temperatures change by 1 per cent. A mere 1 per cent has impact on Australia. The frequency, the duration, the intensity, the spread of climactic events in this country and the impacts that they have are real, and they have been outlined in the Climate Commission's report, which members opposite can access. Things like Cyclone Yazi, that in one year um, saw a decrease in economic growth of 1 per cent, $13 billion, and led, had inflationary impacts of up to 0.8 per cent, 0.8 per cent by one climactic event. So, asking us to delay, order, so, asking order. us. The member for Barker on a point of order. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, on your previous ruling, this is quite variant to what the amendment is about, and I ask you to bring the member back to the amendment. Thank you. The member for Chifley has the call and will address his remarks to the amendments. And, and I'm absolutely uh, the science that underpins what we are trying to do. Um, the, the fact that delay will have an, uh, impose a financial cost, a significant financial cost, what we are being asked by those opposite to do um, has an impact. Order. And the member for Chifley is being relevant to the amendments. There is no point of order that the member for Chifley is being relevant. The member for Chifley has the call. No, member for Barker. Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the the member for Chifley is not at all addressing the, uh, uh, according the to your Barker previous has... response and ruling to this parliament, is not addressing the amendment, which is clearly about deferring a vote until yes, after the next parliament. Yes, the member Barker has made his point parliament. of order. He's made his point of order. Member Chifley is relevant to the amendments, and he has the call. And uh, I also think, and while I might be a rookie compared to the person opposite, but he will. Con he will... Uh, well, I was going to respond to the point of order. You'd made a clear ruling. You'd made a clear ruling in relation to it, and he still persisted with a point of order. Okay. So uh, we've been asked to delay action in response to uh, what's going on, and uh, uh, we can't afford to do that. Um, at the same time, too, those opposite, through by virtue of their amendment, ask us through delay to wait to let to what to what point when they get in, what will they do? In a speech that the Leader of the Opposition gave to this chamber, he dedicated 3,743 words in response to the Prime Minister, 244 of which actually outlined what they were proposing to do. What's interesting in this debate is not just what is said, but what is not said, and by those opposite and what they propose to do, by in effect forcing us to delay implementation and then not outline what they propose to do to meet their bipartisan target. Um, is completely irresponsible to the Australian public. And the fact of the matter is we cannot tolerate an idea that we would delay action given the consequent cost on the, on the general economy of $5 billion a year in not acting beyond 2015, in meeting a bipartisan um, approach, and we simply cannot afford to wait. And this is what their amendment um, would seek for us to do, would make us wait and delay further uh, any action. Order. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Uh, I call the member for Barara. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to uh, speak a little further in relation to the amendment that is being uh, moved by the Leader of the Opposition. And uh, the uh, point is that uh, I uh, uh, made very strongly uh, about the United States of America it was reinforced in a very interesting article 
that I read today in the uh, Melbourne Age. Um, and, uh, it, they were by an, an academic who is very highly regarded, and I suspect very highly regarded by members opposite. Um, and, uh, he is a person of very considerable stature. And, uh, this is Hugh White. Um, and he writes, um, there's the government's tax finally goes to a vote in parliament this week. Remember, remember two tough truths. Uh, first, nothing Australia does by itself will materially affect carbon emissions or the trajectory of the world's weather. Only concerted global action will make any difference. Now we're being told the change that you might be able to make to the weather will be affected by the decisions that we, in fact, make here. Uh, we have, I think, it's been said, one per cent of emissions, um, and uh, we will make no impact on what is going to happen to the rest of the world. And that's the point that Hugh White is making. It's the point I think that is well understood. He goes on and says, second. The chances of concerted global action are low and trending lower. Two years after the collapse at Copenhagen, momentum for the global plan is stalled. As the global economy teeters, this year's Durban follow-up meeting is expected to mark time. Uh, this is not a matter on which we need to act now and that delay is going to hurt us. And that's simply the point that somebody as well respected as Hugh White is making. He goes on to say, the heart of the problem is the world's most complex, important and dangerous relationship. The edgy mix of implacable rivalry and mutual dependence between the United States and China. They are not just the world's two biggest economies and the world's two biggest carbon emitters. They are also the world's most powerful diplomatic players. If they can agree together on a carbon emissions plan, they can make it happen. But if they cannot agree, nothing will happen. It's as simple as that. I have not seen an exposition as clear. Um, this is something that colleagues opposite have uh, fixed their flag to, but the fact is that uh, the fact is that implementation of this legislation without changing global emissions will have a very very significant impact on the cost of doing business in Australia and particularly in relation to those who have to be um, competitive in world trade markets um, and you may talk about the strength of the Australian economy um, but implementing this legislation will leave us considerably worse off that's the bottom line. Um, I made a speech on this matter, a second reading speech, quite early in the debate. And I uh, made it clear um, this is my speech is not a commentary on the science. Um, if, if there was a global response, I would want Australia to be part of it. Um, but I can't see why Australia should be out there largely in isolation. Now, I've heard the arguments about what is said to be happening in the rest of the world. Um, I can't see it. Um, and I've participated um, in conferences abroad, discussed these issues with others who would have some knowledge of what is happening um, in their, uh, their situations. Uh, countries are backing off because they cannot afford in this matter to go it alone in the way in which this government wants to. Um, I jocularly spoke about why members opposite ought to support this amendment. Uh, I think supporting this amendment would in fact get them off the hook. I think they are in a perilous situation as a government. I think they have little prospect of surviving in the situation of implementing legislation that wasn't part of their agenda. I remember a Prime Minister who went to the Australian people on the basis that there would be no carbon tax Order. under a government I lead. Has expired. The question is, Member's time has expired. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call Member for Petrie. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I certainly rise to um, oppose the amendment put forward by the opposition and support uh, the uh, bills 
uh, proper that have been put by the Labor government to finally take action on uh, climate change. It is of no surprise, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the opposition have sought this amendment to push back the introduction of any action on climate change. We have heard a number of members on the other side of this chamber give their reasons why they oppose uh, the action of, uh, on climate change and these bills of the government. We have had members who state that they believe in climate change but then at the same time say that they do not believe human activity is contributing to greenhouse gases at all. So, In other words, they agree that there should be no action because they don't believe in the science. There's those who say it's not the right time. They say it's not the right time because of the global economic circumstances, or as we heard from the member for Barawa, it's not the right time because they think that we're acting before other countries, ignoring all of the information out there and the evidence that many, many countries, 89 countries in fact, have actually signed up on taking action and seeking to achieve the same targets that this government is seeking to, to take. And then, of course, there are those who actually support what the government is doing, and those on the other side who support what the government is doing have chosen not to speak on these bills. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to read the following words. Those of us who do not believe the CSIRO is part of an international green conspiracy to undermine Western civilisation or do not believe that leading scientists like Will Steffen are subversives should not be afraid to speak out and loudly on behalf of our scientists and our science. We must not allow ourselves to be deluded on this issue. Now, let me just say this to you. The idea that our country, this great country of ours, can sail through a three, four or five or more degrees rise in temperature this century with our prosperity and freedom, let alone the Great Barrier Reef, intact is very naive. So this is a big issue. So in the storm of this debate about carbon tax and direct action and what the right approach to climate change should be, do not fall into the trap of abandoning the science. Do not fall into the trap of thinking that what Lord Monckton says or what some website says is superior to what our leading scientists or leading universities would say. These are not my words, Thank Deputy you. Speaker. Probably. These are the words of the member for Wentworth, oh, who oh. said these words in a speech at the inaugural Virginia Chadwick Memorial Foundation Lecture in Sydney on 21 July 2011. I also quote the member for Wentworth on 3 August 2011, National Press Gallery, Questions and Answers. I do think that there has been a war on science to some extent, an attack on climate scientists, so it's common sense we've got to take the science seriously, and I do. I welcome, I welcome the words of the member for Wentworth. There is one member on the other side who actually gets the importance of this action, actually understands the importance of these bills. It is unfortunate, however, that that member, when the time came this afternoon, to really stand up and have conviction behind his own words, behind his own beliefs. He sat there. He sat quietly opposing the bills. Madam Deputy Speaker, we have heard much from the other side about the impact of these bills. Uh, we have heard about the big tax and the impact on households come 1 July 2012. We have heard from the government of the real impact, 0.7 per cent increase on GDP. We have heard that this government, through these bills, will provide assistance to households. But if we had not come into government, Madam Deputy Speaker, on 1 July 2012 there would have been a tax introduced, but it was a 1.5 per cent tax on business that would flow through in full to consumers, to households, with no assistance. And the leader who was introducing this 1.5 per cent tax, had said previously, I would introduce this tax over my dead body. It was the opposition's paid parental leave scheme, Madam Deputy Speaker, a tax of 1.5 per cent, no assistance given, compared to what this government's Order. introducing, which is a 0.7 per cent CPI increase Order. to finally address climate change. The member's time has expired. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the member for Hughes. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
I rise tonight to support the amendment moved by the uh, Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> now, even if you think that this carbon tax is the best thing since sliced bread, even if you swallowed a hook, line and sinker that this carbon tax is going to cool the planet or that it will hold back the rise of the oceans, and even if you believe that unless you pay this carbon tax, the reef will be gone, the polar bears are going to die and we will all be doomed. And even if you're one of those individuals that love big government, and those, if you love one of those who will board the carbon tax gravy train, a gravy train to be funded by families and small business through higher electricity prices, and even if you're one of those foreign carbon traders who will be enriched by this scheme, I ask you to stop and pause and think that the damage that passing this legislation will do to our democratic system without this amendment. For we all remember, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the dying days before the last election, with the polls deadlocked, the Prime Minister stared down the lens of the camera and pledged to the nation that there will be no carbon tax under the government that I lead. That's the promise that everyone that's sitting on that side of the chamber was elected on. But earlier today, the very same government led by the Prime Minister, well, the Prime Minister for the meantime anyway, has voted to impose the world's biggest carbon tax upon our nation. What an outright betrayal of our democratic principles. And here it is, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 19 pieces of legislation, 1,129 pages, over a quarter of a million words. Now, is there anyone sitting over there, that side of the chamber, can say that they've honestly read all this legislation and they understand it? I bet not. I bet not. And this is the most radical piece of legislation in the last decade that's been rammed through Parliament in an underhanded and un undemocratic way. Now, the guiding principle of our democracy, one that you may well laugh about, one that our forefathers actually sacrificed their lives for to safeguard, is that we here in Parliament are agents of the people. The power, of the, and the pa power of this Parliament vests from the freely expressed will of the people. That's something that you lot should never forget. But this carbon tax is not the freely expressed will of the people. And despite millions spent on propaganda to manipulate public opinion, despite the scare campaigns and the gross distortions, the electorate remains overwhelmingly opposed to this tax. Do you want to keep on playing this? So while those that bleak like uh, mindless sheep— Order, order. The honourable member will resume his seat. Uh, the honourable member for— um, Relevance, we're addressing the amendment. I'd ask the member to come back to the oh, no. amendment, which is a point of order raised by those on the other side numerous times tonight on our speakers. I thank the honourable member for Cunningham. Uh, we are, in fact, debating the amendments, and the honourable member will confine his comments to the provisions of the amendments before the House. I call the honourable member for Hughes. So while that those that bleat like mindless sheep, regurgitating the spin of putting a price on carbon, or more truthfully, a price on carbon dioxide, I ask you to first put a price on our democracy. And to those that say they respect the science, well, that's fine. But I say you firstly respect our democracy. But the actions of this government to deny a public a vote on this bill says a lot about the ideology that those that sit opposite. They have no respect for our democracy. They believe that they are a group of privileged elites and that they know better than the public. They do not care about the will of the people. They don't care about the importance of our democracy. And that's why the community is or so angry. Order. The honourable member will once again resume his seat. I call the honourable member for Cunningham. I'm sorry, Deputy Speaker. I think he's defying your calling. He's continuing with the written speech, which is not on the topic of the amendment before the Order. House. Order. The honourable member for Hughes will confine himself to the topics of the amendments before the chamber. The honourable member for Hughes has the call. Mr. Deputy Speaker. But that's why the community is so angry. That's why passions are running so high against this tax. It's because the people feel deceived, they feel double-crossed, they feel cheated, they feel they've been lied to and they feel they have not had their say. The That's the amendment. And, and to the so-called independents, shame on you. The strength and legitimacy of the independents in this place in the past has been on the principles of keeping the bastards honest. But their actions of aiding and abetting this Prime Minister to break her promise 
to the electorate is Order, why they've the lost respect. Order. The time has expired. The question before the chair is that the amendments be agreed to. I now call the government whip, the honourable member for Shortland. Ah, yes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I rise to oppose the amendment. The amendment that is wait till Tony's in the lodge before we do anything. And, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd have to say, I'd have to say that a he's putting the horse before the car, and b everybody in this parliament, everybody in this parliament knows where the Leader of the Opposition stands when it comes to climate change. We understand why he's moved this amendment. We understand that the Leader of the Opposition was the man that has stood up and said that climate change is crap. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is absolutely no— Order. The Honourable Member— The Order. The, no order. the Government will, will please resume her seat. Uh, the Honourable Member for Herbert on a point of order. Uh, as with the Member for Petrie and the Member for Cunningham, the Member for Shortland is not addressing the legislation before the, or the amendment before the party. I ask to draw both comments back to the actual legislation. The Honourable Member should be aware that in this debate there has been quite a wide-ranging debate on the amendments. The amendments do cover quite a large amount of ground, but I would counsel the Government Whip, who has been here for a number of years, to focus carefully uh, on what we are discussing in the chamber at the present time. Absolutely, Mr Deputy Speaker. And what I am concentrating my comments on are not the legislation, it's not the amendments, it's not the Comedy Act of the member for Barara as he twisted and turned when he tried to uh, explain his position and his party's position in relation to this amendment. It's not the, the words of a sceptic of the member for McKellar when she stood up and referred to so-called climate change. I'm looking at this amendment that we have before us here, this amendment that's about doing nothing. Now, members on the other side of this parliament, members on the other side of this parliament are very lo long on rhetoric. They're very good at uh, just giving excuses of why we should do nothing. They're very good at referring to even if you believe, which obviously leads those of us on this side of the parliament to believe that they don't believe that such a thing as climate change exists. That's why they want to do nothing. That's why they're not prepared to act now. They don't believe that the uh, extreme climate events that we've been subjected to in our country and throughout the world have anything to do with climate change. Rather, they think that we should sit on our hands and do absolutely nothing <coughs> till, with, with a tiny bit of luck, they think, with a bit of luck, and the member for McKellar referred to the polling and saying, Oh, well, these polls look pretty good at the moment, so why don't we push for an election and hope, hope that, uh, that we, might end up in, we might end up with Tony in the Lodge. Tony in the Lodge. That's, uh, uh, look, that's order, where the, they'd like order, to see it on the order. other side of the, the The government whip ought to refer to the Leader of the Opposition by his title and not by his name. Oh, certainly, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I apologise most profusely for not referring to the Leader of the Opposition the as, a, as a member for Warringah, and I, I will do so in future. Please accept my apologies in relation to that. Uh, this, uh, this delay is about waiting until the Leader of the Opposition uh, has positioned himself so as that he may realise his lifetime dream of, uh, of, of living in the Lodge. And to do that, to do that, he thinks that uh, if, he, if he can get there uh, order, and the if we do nothing— uh, The honourable government will, will resume her seat. The member for McKellar is seeking the call, presumably on a point of order. Yes, on a point of order, Mr Deputy um, Speaker. Uh, we've been debating uh, these amendments um, together, both the government and the opposition amendment, as I understand it. And even on my reading of the government's amendments, there is no way in the world what the um, member across the way is discussing is relevant to any of them at all. And I would ask you to bring her back. Maybe she could discuss the, the unadjusted the, the, provisional the emissions number divided by the total number of trustees. Uh, the member for McKellar is right to the extent that we have had a wide-ranging debate. Uh, however, however, 
the member for Shortland ought to focus, at least to some extent, on what we're discussing. The member for, McKellar, the member for uh, Shortland, the government whip, has the call. Deputy Speaker, I've been focusing on the amendment made by the Leader of the Opposition, which I oppose. And if I could say statements by those on the other side of this parliament that Australia is, trying, is leading. Um, <coughs> the honourable member on a point of order. The time Next has expired. Uh, the honourable member for Macarthur has the call. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise today to support the opposition leader's amendment for the carbon tax be deferred until after an election. I am compelled to speak on this issue because I believe the people of Macarthur deserve the chance to have their say when it comes to the biggest tax change in Australia's history. This government has no mandate to introduce this carbon tax legislation. Before the last election, the Prime Minister said there would be no carbon tax under a government she leads. The Treasurer said we have made our position very clear. We have ruled it out. And the Minister for Climate Change said we know that you can't have any environmental certainty with a carbon tax. Surely these comments will come back to haunt them sometime. Absolutely. These comments are proof that the people of Australia were led to believe that there would be no carbon tax under this government. The people of MacArthur were misled and they deserve the chance to have their opinion heard. The people should have their say in regards to this tax. On the government's own website, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade states that under a responsible government, the executive is accountable to the parliament and the parliament to the people. This isn't occurring at the present time. No, this Greens Labor Alliance treats the people of Australia with contempt. We are all accountable to the people of this country and the people we represent in our electorates. We must not mislead them into trusting false claims and promises, but instead we should listen to them and ensure that their opinions are heard, especially when, they are talking, when we are talking about the biggest tax change in our country's history. It is no secret, Mr Deputy Speaker, that Australians will start paying $105 billion in tax between now and 2020 under a Labor and Greens carbon tax, a trillion dollars over the coming decades. This will have a significant impact on the Australian economy, driving up electricity prices by 10 per cent and putting thousands of jobs at risk. Residents in my electorate are already doing it tough. Some are struggling to pay their bills and others require vouchers to pay for electricity and food. How can anyone support a tax which will mean higher electricity bills, increased grocery prices and job losses with no environmental gain? Tell that to the people of MacArthur. This tax, will impact, this tax will impact on our entire community. The average punter can tell you that now is the worst possible time to introduce a new tax that will drive down Australia's economy, especially while international economic conditions are so uncertain. If the government's legislation is passed, Australians will pay an extra $9 billion a year in tax, but Australians' emissions will increase from 578 million tonnes to 628 million tonnes by 2020. On top of the tax itself, an extra $3.5 billion will have to be spent on purchasing foreign carbon credits each year by 2020. It's just not the struggling families of my electorate who will suffer as a result of this tax. I've spoken to many small business owners who will be forced to cut jobs or close down as a result of this tax. The TRN Group, the p and Engineering, Stockade Pies, San Bello Menswear, Sport Spirit and many more businesses in my electorate have raised real concerns about the impact of this tax. A lot of blood, sweat and tears have gone into these businesses and they don't deserve to suffer as a result of the tax which will not do anything for their environment. Last week I attended a carbon tax debate in Liverpool, as did the members for Hughes and Werriwa, and at least 80 per cent of the crowd was against the carbon tax and were very vocal in, in regards to the effect it will have on their families. It was clear that these people resent the fact that they did not have the opportunity to vote on this tax during their last election. They, like all Australians, have a right to voice their opinion on this tax, which is why it should be deferred until after an election. Today I'd like to quote the government's own climate guru, Tim Flannery. He states, if we cut emissions today, global temperatures are not likely to drop for about a thousand years. One thousand years. According to Labor's own figures, a carbon tax will not clean up Australia's environment. In a recent World Health Organisation study of urban air quality, in 1,100 cities and towns around the globe, Australia came third behind Estonia and Mauritius. So we're actually doing a good job with, it, with fighting pollution in our cities right now, especially compared to other developed countries, and we've achieved this without a carbon tax. Third in the world for clean air. I'd be interested to see how many constituents have contacted their local Labor MPs to voice their opinion against this carbon tax. Our role is to represent the people of Australia in this parliament. We should all aim to keep faith of the people who live in our electorates. There must be many Labor MPs opposite who can't look themselves in the mirror tonight after passing this carbon tax today. This tax is based on a lie and it's a broken promise made to a nation that generally wants to improve the environment. 
but not at the cost of our jobs, our livelihoods or our children's futures. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the amendments to defer this tax until after the election for many reasons, mostly because of the people of MacArthur don't want it and many can't afford it, but also because this will be the biggest tax change in Australia's history, which will have no positive impact on our environment, and Australians should have a right to vote for a government who will not mislead them into thinking otherwise. I now give the call to the honourable member for McEwen. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to oppose the amendments that uh, the opposition have brought forward because I think we sit down and we have a look through this. This has been a culmination of, uh, of this debate that's been running for almost two decades. Twenty years we've talked about climate change and taking action on it. We've seen something like 35 uh, inquiries, parliamentary inquiries into climate change since 1994. There's been a lot of discussion about this, and so far, the only people taking action—I'll I'll happily readdress that question for the tuck shop raiders over there. Before the last election, before the last election, we had a climate change forum in my, my electorate. In my electorate, and I said strongly, I support action on climate change and I support cutting pollution. But where was the Liberal Party candidate? He didn't even have the guts to front up. Didn't even front up. I said that before, and I'll say it again. Didn't even have the stomach to front up. I'd like to address some of the things that have been said earlier tonight in this debate. The member for Curtin came in here and the said the 1998 election was an election on GST. This was her words. Uh, he will remain silent. That the the Prime Minister McEwen Howard continues took to have the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister Howard took to the election the GST. Well, in the 1998 election. Uh, it was Labor that actually won the majority of the vote. So, by their standards, by the standards that the member of a curtain brought forward earlier tonight, they should never have introduced it. They never had a mandate. But suddenly, that's a bit different. And for, their, for those offered, let's remember the ALP scored 50, over 50 per cent of the vote in the 2010 election, and the National Party, the combined extremists over there, 3.34 per cent. I think back to um, we talked about you know the honesty that, that uh, about this election, and I can remember that, we, that we've got the uh, leader of the opposition saying we should hold off this until after an election. The same opposition leader who said we should have a plebiscite on it, we should have a plebiscite on carbon tax. Again, they're trying to use the, they're trying to say that we should have a democratic right to do nothing. But when it came to the plebiscite, what did the opposition leader say? His exact words in the Herald Sun, June 20. Mr Abbott told 3AW uh, order, he would or, not or, accept or, the plebiscite. Or, 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 order. Firstly, the member for McEwen must remember he ought to refer to the Leader of the Opposition by his title and not by his name. And now I gather the member for McKellar is seeking the call on a point of order. The Honourable Member for McKellar. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I've searched through uh, all the amendments that have been moved uh, that we're debating, and I can't see a reference to a plebiscite anywhere. I'd ask you to get the, the, the member, member to come back McKellar to the topic will of the amendments. Her seat. This is a very wide-ranging debate. I think, in my view, regrettably too wide-ranging. Uh, but we are discussing a broad range of amendments, and the honourable member for McEwen has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and maybe the member for McCallum might want to go back and listen to the speeches no, tonight the member for, member for that her friends have mentioned. On the and they amendments would, before the House. Certainly, Deputy Speaker. And the plebiscite, which was mentioned earlier tonight, just before the dinner break, uh, it was the Leader of the Opposition who said that even if the plebiscite came out supporting a carbon price, he would not agree with it. So he doesn't agree with the election result that we won. He doesn't agree with having a plebiscite that he wants. Now he wants us to sit there and take nothing. The only thing we can agree is that suit should have gone in the 1980s with you. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, this this debate is, uh, on these amendments is ridiculous. We cannot keep sitting there. We cannot keep sitting there and listening to these people trying to stop taking action on climate change. This is about ensuring our nation's future. It's about ensuring our kids' future, and it's about ensuring uh, where we go in the future. We have a look at, at the two parties and what they've said on. Order. The honourable member uh, will resume his seat. The member for McKellar is seeking the call. Again, I presume, on a point of order. Indeed, on a point the of order. The Honourable Member for McKellar now has the call. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, prior to your assuming the chair, we had uh, a different Deputy Speaker in the chair who limited the terms of the debate quite considerably. And while it was true uh, that there was a wide-ranging debate earlier, uh, the ruling of the uh, other Deputy Speaker narrowed the debate. And, uh, 
Uh, unless, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have a ruling to the contrary, uh, I think that the member has to uh, be pulled right back to the very strict meaning okay. of the amendments as the, moved. I, I congratulate the member for McKellar on a very good try. Um, the member for McEwen has the call and his time has almost expired. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I'll just remind the member of McKellar tonight she admitted they are not interested in the national interest, they are only interested in polls. And let's remember that their idea of action on climate change to save the Great Barrier Reef was to cover it in shade cloth. Honourable members, time has expired. I now give the call to the honourable member for Dunkley. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. This is an opportunity for those opposite to deal with the calculated deception that was perpetrated on the Australian public. And I look out over this chamber and I look across to the Labor members and I ask myself, I wonder how many would actually not be here had they been straight with the Australian public. Well, well, actually, and I'm very order, interested in order, that. And there's an opportunity order, order, for them to do so. Order. The member for Dunkley has, I think, accused the Prime Minister of calculated deception. I it, think if he has, he oh, will no, withdraw. No, no, I haven't yet. yet. Not yet. Uh, no, that was the last time I spoke. You no, you, that, you so. mentioned calculated deception. Did I? Okay. Uh, if I did say calculated deception, did. as accurate as that is, I withdraw. No, and I ask the honourable member will, to talk will about withdraw unreservedly. I do so. So we've got an opportunity we'll tonight for the opposition amendment to be supported by this chamber, and hopefully that might allow Labor members of Parliament to not be recognised for two great deficits in their time in office. We know the budget deficit that great world record that they've already achieved is something they own and will never be taken away from them. But what is most damaging about this debate is the democratic deficit that is being perpetrated on the Australian parliament and on this public. To have the Prime Minister stare down television cameras and assure Australian voters that there'd be no carbon tax under a government that she led was a calculated action designed to create order, the impression. Order. The honourable member. Calculate. Oh, come on, deputy speaker. No, calculated the fact action. is, I'm going to sit you down unless you observe the standing orders. It's inappropriate okay. under Standing Order 89 and 90 to use offensive words or to cast reflection well, on honourable right. members. I'll now, come and visit you later to gain some knowledge because no, calculated no, is hardly the, offensive. The, 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 the situation you can is. Tell me where I've got the honourable member will either withdraw. Or the call right. will be withdrawn. I withdraw using the word calculated. Where does that imply? That's just no, 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 I think is, you misheard me on that occasion. No, I think I you heard said you order. The honourable member will resume his seat. The, the, what the honourable member has said is he has accused the prime minister of calculated deception. He will withdraw that, or I will name him. I will withdraw that again and will invite no, no, I won't invite you to check what I've said. The, I didn't member use those words, has the, call. So. the issue we have today is a question about whether the government will support the opposition's amendment to actually give the Australian public a chance to vote on this policy measure. They've been denied that opportunity. They were reassured that no such proposal would be introduced by a Labor government that Prime Minister Gillard led. Yet here we are today talking about this very measure that the Australian public was assured they wouldn't be confronted with. Now, just today, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry has released yet another paper that shows how the government's failed to calculate the impact of its carbon tax on the small and medium enterprises of Australia. Now, the amendment that the opposition's put forward would give the minister an opportunity to carefully examine this material. And for those members on all sides of the chamber to consider the urgings of Aki, where they say, armed with this research, all parliamentarians should think again before burdening small business with the carbon tax. It goes on to point out how some of the comparable schemes that the government refers to have none of the characteristics of the carbon tax being imposed on the Australian public. It has none of the burdens that are being imposed on the small and, be small and medium sized enterprises of Australia. So there's an opportunity here for the government members, by supporting the opposition amendment, to recover some policy and political legitimacy around this debate. 
Time and time again, there are examples of where the government has failed to understand the impact of its changes. Even in this Victorian government study undertaken by Deloitte's Access Economics, it makes the point that the parameters that the Commonwealth have used in their modelling assume zero employment impacts. Zero employment impacts. That is the assumption. Yet when you actually look at the impacts in my electorate alone, there's about by 2015, an estimated 1,385 jobs to be lost in the city of Frankston and Mornington Peninsula Shire areas, and some $154 million of economic output. Now, time and time again, these facts are brought forward before the government, and they fail to address them. Even the insult that the minister inflicted on the small business community, telling them not to worry about the impact of the carbon tax, because I think you can't get your car serviced in India and your dry cleaning done in China. Now, what a nonsense argument that is. His actions and the government's carbon tax policy are impacting on demand. They're already undermining small Order business viability, and they are also hollowing out employment in that important sector. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I now give the call to the honourable member for Cunningham. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I want to rise to oppose the opposition's amendment to the bills before us tonight. It's an amendment about timing, and I want to indicate some important words to the House, and I'm going to quote them to get them accurate. Deputy Speaker, we have an obligation to manage climate change responsibly on behalf of future generations so that our prosperity today is a legacy they too can enjoy tomorrow. The Australian economy depends more on fossil fuels for its wealth generation and power supply than most developed economies, and we are a significant supplier of energy to the world. Adjusting to a carbon-constrained economy will entail costs. We cannot change the structure of our economy overnight, and we need to manage the transition with care. Yet, as well as costs, the same transition will also present new opportunities. We are richly endowed with natural assets um, that will be valuable in a carbon-constrained world. Uh, will resume her seat. The member for Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I draw your attention to the state of the house. Quorum not present. Ring the bells. A quorum present, the honourable member for Cunningham has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I'll continue uh, as I was quoting. We are richly endowed with natural assets that will be valuable in a carbon constrained world, including high quality geological and biological sequestration sites, large uranium reserves, and abundant renewable energy resources, including geothermal energy opportunities. An important component of Australia's climate change policy is developing low, key low emissions technologies to realise these opportunities. Climate change is a global problem, and Australia cannot solve it alone. The multifaceted response set out in this document will ensure Australia leads the world in our domestic approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and is a key player in effective international responses to climate change. 
Deputy Speaker, these were the words of July 2007 that the member opposite sought to interrupt my quoting, and they are the words of John Howard. Mr Deputy Speaker, John Howard understood in July 2007, and those who were in government at the time opposite understood, that it was important for Australia to play its role in leading the world on an important new challenge that the world faced, as we have done generation after generation in important issues that challenged and faced the world. And those opposite now would have us believe that the Australian people are not up to this task. Deputy Speaker, they are up to this task. I want to put before the House an event that I attended yesterday with my colleague, the member for Throsby, where we were, had the opportunity to attend a, the uh, NRE Gujarat No. 1 colliery site at Russellvale in my electorate, where we were celebrating the positioning of new longwall machinery valued at $90 million uh, with, in conjunction with Joy Manufacturing, a, a production manufacturing company in my colleague, the member for Throsby's electorate a really important commitment by the local company, uh, Gujarat NRE, an Indian miner in our area, in their faith and um, commitment to the future of mining in our region and an important opportunity uh, to create— The honourable member's time has expired. I now— Well, the honourable member has the opportunity to seek a second call. However, the practice of the House is to alternate speakers from one side to the other, uh, and if the honourable member chooses to stand when it is next the government's opportunity, I will look upon her um, with uh, favour, uh, as indeed I would with all members on my right uh, or my left. Uh, uh, the uh, call is now given to the second deputy speaker, the honourable member for Maranoa. Uh, th thank you, deputy speaker, and I rise this evening on this clean energy bill to support the amendment as moved by the Leader of the Opposition. And I just want to read into the hands hard yet again, for the benefit of those on the other side of the House, why we are seeking to amend this package of bills, to delay this package voting on this bill and take these 1,200 pages to the people of Australia. That's what should be happening. And let me read, for the benefit of those on the other side of the House, what the Leader of the Opposition and the Opposition would like to see happen, and that is that, and this is our amendment, that the provisions of this Act commence on a date to be fixed by proclamation, and two, a proclamation for the purposes of subsection one must not be made until after elections have been held for the 44th Parliament and Parliament has met. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, why do we say that on this side of the House? Is because the Prime Minister today, when she was the Prime Minister in the last parliament, said there would be no carbon tax under a government that she leads. And yet what we've got in this House are 1,200 pages of new legislation, one of the greatest pieces of, one of, one of, the great pieces of misleading right information that any Prime Minister has ever bestowed on the Australian people. And if you don't want to take the Prime Minister's word and don't accept what she said, let's look at what the Treasurer said on the 15th of August. He said, it should meet the press, 15th of August 2010, when asked the question, will there be a carbon tax uh, if, you, if the Labor Party was elected? He said, and I quote, well, certainly what we rejected is this hysterical allegation that somehow we are moving towards a carbon tax from the Liberals in their advertising. We certainly reject that. So I want two counts from the Prime Minister today and the Prime Minister and the Treasurer, both giving firm commitments to the people of Australia before they had a vote to decide who they should put into government in this parliament. There will be no carbon tax under a government led by the now Prime Minister supported by the now Treasurer, who said this is an hysterical allegation and they reject the notion. Well, the people of Australia looked at the, the two sides of the House, and that's what democracy is about. They look at the policies from the two opposing sides of the House. It's a contest of ideas. Who do they really trust to put in on policies to lead this nation? It's a very important decision that people take. So, Deputy Speaker, we always say 
is take this package of bills back to the people of Australia and ask them. Don't ask this House. Ask the people of Australia. That's what our amendment says, that there be no vote taken on this until the people of Australia have been asked. Deputy Speaker, I went during the, during the break to drive into the outback of my electorate because I know that if this bill passes, it will, it will impact on everyone's day to li daily cost of living wherever they live in Australia. So I went out in search of someone in Western Queensland who might support these bills. I went to Charleville. I thought, well, I might find someone there that was once a, a stronghold of the Labor Party, still in the office of the AWU in Charleville. I couldn't find anyone. I couldn't find anyone there. So then I went on to Quilpie. I thought I'd find someone there. No one there. And I went further out to Aramanga into the oil fields and I caught up with Dick Lovejoy. I, no, I, I caught up with Dick Loveday. He's loading cattle to take them 1,100 kilometres from far out in Western Queensland and my electorate to a processing plant near Toowoomba. Now he's been branded one of those big polluters because you're bringing these cattle on road trains that create jobs, create export income. And he was said, give us a go at these bills. He said, we want to vote on these bills. He said, we are sick and tired of being working for nothing and all we see are taxes, taxes, taxes from this government. He said, if, if, he said just give us a say. So on returning to this place, I thought, well, I'll bring these comments to this parliament. The minister's at the table. Now, Minister, I, I plead with you, please, please, listen to the Leader of the Opposition, listen to our amendments. Let's take um, these bills order, to a vote and ask the people order, of Australia. The honourable member's time has expired, and I'm quite sure that Mr Speaker has pointed out that props are not desirable. However, I'd like to congratulate the second Deputy Speaker on the fact that he has obviously undertaken weight training to lift those papers so easily in the House. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I now once again give the call to the Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I want to take, I thank uh, you and the House for the opportunity to finish the comments that we interrupted by the quorum call previously. Deputy Speaker, I just want to again put into context the comments that I am contributing about the amendment for, by the opposition on timing by indicating again from July 2007 the Australia's climate change policy of the then government, led by those opposite, which says Australia's domestic policies will influence and be influenced by effective and practical international responses to climate change. It may take some time for a truly effective international framework for emissions reductions to emerge. It is likely that in the near term progress will be made through national and bilateral actions a domestic emissions trading scheme, investment in low emissions technologies and energy efficiency measures in Australia will create opportunities as the international framework emerges. Within the context of the 2007 policy of those opposite, Deputy Speaker, I want to indicate that, um, as I was saying, my colleague, the member for Throsby, and I attended an important event in our electorate, which was the announcement and unveiling of long wall mining machinery by NRE Gujarat, uh, an important local mining company in our area, and our celebration of that. And it was done within the context, Deputy Speaker, of a statement uh, made to the um, stock exchange by Gujarat on the 4th of October 2011. It was headed uh, implication of carbon tax for carbon tax for Gujarat NRE, and I just want to. Um, it is an extensive statement, Deputy Speaker, but I just want to go to the conclusion so that it can be put on the record of this place that, in terms of the time frame that we're looking at here, there has been, as many speakers have said, two decades of debate on these issues. We got to a point in July 2007 where there was bilateral agreement, and the very issues that are being so attempted to be undermined by the arguments of those opposite were in fact their policy and printed for the world to see at that point in time. But companies in our country are actually moving on. They're moving on. This is what Gujarat NRE has said. The company expects that it would be eligible for government assistance via the coal sector jobs package, which will assist in reducing the overall impact of the tax. 
However, substantive emissions management strategy is being developed as part of each mining operation to ensure that emissions are controlled. Mr Jagger Tramka, executive chairman for GNCCL, said, and quote, it quotes, we have actively investigated action that will be undertaken to reduce our total emissions of greenhouse gases, the development of new underground roadways separate from the old and existing mine workings, supports the sealing off of those old workings and prevents waste gases from being included in our mine's ventilation system. Into the future, the company is committed to utilising ventilation controls the sealing of old mining areas and gas drainage techniques that will allow the capture and flaring of the gas. Based upon this strategy and the above-mentioned measures, the potential impacts of the carbon tax are expected to be around $2.70 per tonne of coal produced. It is apparent that the direct impacts of the carbon tax will be minimised, and this is not expected to impinge on future growth of the company. Deputy Speaker, it is important to acknowledge that companies in this country understand the international dilemma that we all face about the need to get our carbon emissions down, that they are in fact investigating and seeking opportunities to do exactly that. This is a mining company in my own area. I've had five generations of my family work at this mine since the 1900s, in fact. And it is a mine that understands the challenges of the future. It's a company that's up to the challenges of the future. It reflects, I believe, the great strength of this nation, that our companies and our communities are up to the challenges of the future and, in fact, up to taking the opportunities of the future. It is sad that those opposite persist in a narrow, negative and, I believe, a view of our capacity as a nation that will not be proven to last the test of time. Now is the time for action. This amendment should be rejected and we should get behind leading the world, as we have done so well in so many areas for so many generations. It is time now that we act. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Indi. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise with great sadness because there is so much concern out there in the community, not just uh, limited to one demographic, but right across the board, and there is particular anxiety and sadness in those demographics that have traditionally voted Labor, and those members opposite know that. They are defying not just the wishes and concerns of their constituents. They are destroying the future opportunities and prosperity of their communities, and they know it. And for what? For what? For the short-term political gain, for the short-term political survival of the worst Prime Minister this country has ever seen. We've had a lot of cute comments, a lot of gilding of the lily to try and justify the position they've taken in supporting an economy-wide carbon tax that will do absolutely nothing to save the environment and, in fact, arguably will increase worldwide emissions by exporting manufacturing to countries that don't have the same environmental regulations as we do, who will make the same things we used to make but create more emissions doing so. They know it. We have seen the, um, we have seen the experience in Europe where um, carbon leakage has um, risen massively, where uh, Europe has lost industries only to have it replaced by industries abroad that um, have increased um, carbon emissions. We've seen the minister, and um, he's coming back to the table, I'm grateful for that, be very cute and use a twist of words, trying to claim some sort of implicit carbon tax. And he was very embarrassed when he was exposed, when that was exposed as an absolute fraud, trying to claim that China was moving ahead of us and, and, and moving in leaps and bounds, when in fact the reality is that China is engaged in a massive, in an extraordinary increase in emissions. They will replace they will replace coal-fired power stations with other coal-fired power stations, and they will increase their emissions uh, far more than Australia will. We have seen the US abandon an ETS. We've seen the Japanese decide to postpone it, and we've seen that countries that compete with Australia, they're not even contemplating to introduce an ETS. We've seen the um, 
the discussion on the steel transformation plan. Well, if you weren't going to damage an industry as important as this with a sledgehammer, you wouldn't need to contemplate this very expensive use of taxpayers' funds to compensate them. But what about what about the vast majority of steel workers who aren't going to be covered? Because at the moment, where the most recent figures we have is there are about 91,000 employees across the uh, entire Australian steel industry, and the steel transformation plan will only cover those in blue scope and one steel, and at best there are 17,000 employees there. You cannot have a viable steel-making industry in Australia without a viable steel fabrication industry. If there are no steel fabricators in Australia, then there is no need for steel to be made in Australia, particularly since Blue Scope has closed the door for the moment on its export market. So it is a fraud. It is a fraud to say that the steel transformation plan will save the steel industry because there is no plan for when this uh, money runs out, because it hasn't addressed the basic problem of competitiveness. It hasn't addressed the problem of what happens when this um, money runs out, when imports, which effectively will be given a leg up with this reverse tariff that we have on Australian industry and Australian manufacturing. And as for the green jobs, what a joke, what a farce. Nowhere in the world have we seen the destruction of jobs in industry be replaced with commensurate jobs in the green sector, and it will not happen here. Constituents in my electorate are extremely concerned about the retarding impact that the carbon tax will have on development of their rural and regional communities, of the impact of uh, the carbon tax on prices on their cost of living. And I'm sure it is the same in non-rural and regional electorates, and I'm sure it is the same in Labor electorates as well. And the people will have a say. They should have a say at the next election. And I take the opportunity to seek leave to table some signatures of over um, 1,200 people Order in my electorate who have opposed a carbon tax and want to expired. seek an election. I seek leave. Um, while the time has technically expired, I will ask the minister is leave granted. Leave is not granted. Oh, no, no, uh, Mr. Chair, I actually, uh, I actually asked before the time had expired. And, and I gave the honourable member the benefit of the doubt, and I asked the minister was leave granted, and the minister, I believe, said leave was no, not granted. Order. The honourable member, the honourable member for Indi is warned. The honourable member for Indi is warned. I name the honourable member for Indi. I have named the honourable member for Indi. The minister. I move that the uh, member's services be suspended from the house. The question before the chair is: the honourable member's services or the the uh, the honourable member be su suspended from the service of the house? I put that question. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Order, uh, lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the honourable member for Indi uh, be suspended from the service of the House. That the eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose will pass to the left of the chair. I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Chifley as tellers for the eyes, and I appoint the honourable members for Barker. Barker and Parks as tellers for the nose.
order. The result of the division is ayes 71, noes 57. The honourable member for Indi is suspended from the services of the House for 24 hours. The honourable member will remove herself from the House. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call, once he gets to his seat, the honourable the Chief Government Whip. Well, I thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, I, I thank the House. I think if uh, anyone amongst the Australian public were in any doubt about what the debate has largely been about this evening, uh, that doubt has now been removed by the actions and the antics not only of the member for Indi, who has now been appropriately discharged from the duties of the House, but also, for example, by the antics of the member for Patterson, uh, who, despite the government's decision to facilitate this debate, decided to call a quorum quite inappropriately throughout the course of uh, that debate. Well, I hope he's about to call a quorum now because he'll be thrown out just as the member seat. for— um, There is a point of order. Uh, I gather the member for Patterson Speaker, uh, on a point of order. Uh, but, before, but before I give the call to the member for Patterson, I would ask honourable members who are milling around the chamber, including the members for Groom and the member for other, other, other honourable members, to resume their seat so I can give the call to the member for Patterson, who I suspect is taking a point of order. The member for Patterson. Mr Deputy Speaker, in line with your earlier rulings and other previous deputy speakers occupying the chair tonight, I ask you to bring the member to the amendments at hand, and he is not addressing the issues of the amendments the before. The Honourable Member for Patterson will resume his seat. The member for Patterson is correct in saying that honourable members ought to be debating the amendments before the House. The amendments are, however, wide-ranging. But I would urge the Chief Government Whip to confine himself to the wide-ranging amendments the House is currently debating. The Chief Government Whip has the call. And I, I certainly respect your uh, ruling, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I should say that while I've not been here as, member, as long as the member for McKellar, um, who has been very active in this debate this evening, I have been here for some 15 and a half years, and I've been a student of the parliamentary processes for much longer than that. And I've never seen such an extraordinary course of events. Never has it been known to have a, such a wide-ranging and broad amendment moved in the in-detail stages of a government bill. Usually it's not that strange for an opposition with no new ideas and no alternative solutions to put forward such a, an amendment as to defer the actions of the will of the House, but it's extraordinary that they should put such an amendment in the in detail uh, parts of a, of a, of a debate, a, a period of debate which, of course, is usually confined to the very specifics of the very complex legislation often uh, before the House. So, how extraordinary it is that, having done so, that they would spend all of their time or most of their time tonight giving up the time the government agreed to give them for further debate on the clean energy bills, wasting time taking frivolous uh, points of order. There they were on the other side, taking points of order, um, ignoring points of order from this side, continuing to read their speeches no matter what the Deputy Speaker is ruling. But what's even more extraordinary than that, Mr, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that you know, we all stand here in defence of democracy on a daily basis. People over the ages have given their lives for democracy, indeed Australian soldiers continue to give their lives for democracy and the opportunity to participate and take ownership of parliamentary democracy. But the proposition of the opposition tonight is that from now on, if you have some hard reform to put to the Australian people, to the parliament, you should go and seek the will of the Australian people on every occasion. Imagine if Gough Whitlam and those who followed him had done that on tariff reform. Imagine if Paul Keating had done that on the floating of the dollar. Mr. Speaker, it's just not the way our democracy works, and nor should it be the way democracy works. There are only two people, uh, two sorts of people in the world. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, there are leaders and there are followers. And the Prime Minister and those who stand behind her on this side have shown very, very strong leadership. 
picking up on an issue which has been debated in this country for the last 20 years. We, the government, went to the last election promising to act on climate change, just as John Howard went to the 2007 election promising to act on climate change. Indeed, John Howard went to the 2007 election not with an architecture for, in terms of his response to climate change, not unlike the architecture we are putting through the House tonight and indeed we've been debating in this place for a long, long time. So when the Australian people pick up their newspapers tomorrow and look at and, uh, and come to understand the antics that took place in this House tonight, the crescendo of course being the um, the expulsion of the, the member for Indi, they Order. will understand what this Order debate is really members. about. Time has expired. The member for Dawson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the amendment before us tonight is to let the people have a say on this carbon tax by having it after the election. Mr Speaker, what I want to do now is highlight some of the people that have not been able to have a say, that really want to have a say. People from my electorate, like Sally Ann Pottinger of Shoal Point, who says if the carbon tax goes ahead, she will never vote Labor again. Mary Old of Mackay, who says the government does not have a mandate from the people for this. Diane Worthington of Seaforth, who says she will never vote Labor again uh, if this tax goes through. Rob Geisler of Shoal Point, Labor voter of 29 years, who will not be voting again like that if the tax goes through. Susan Griffin, who says that, uh, that, that, that this will not do anything to improve our carbon footprint but will affect our wallets. Diane Pulfer of Slade Point, says no to the carbon tax. Rodney Barrett of Bowen says that this is all pain and no gain. Leslie Cuthbert of Glenella who says no to the carbon tax. Michael Smith of Dolphin Heads does not support a carbon tax. David Drage, Mount Pleasant, no to the carbon tax. Glenn McCarr, a, a, a builder from Mackay, who says the Labor government needs to go sooner rather than later because of this carbon tax. Peter Harding of Mackay, who says don't let them waste more of our money with this carbon tax. Robbie Morris of Glenella, Another useless labour tax, he calls it. Pat O'Shea from Balnagown disagrees with this proposed carbon tax. Paula McInnes of Andergrove, who says that people cannot afford this carbon tax. Joe Dance of Mount Julian, who says that this tax is a crime against humanity. A bit, uh, a bit poetic there, but I agree. Elizabeth Taylor of Caelan, who says she, that the Prime Minister is not listening to the people. The, uh, the, Van, Lint, the Van Lint family of Balnagown who say no to the carbon tax. Nigel Reck of Mackay, who well, says this has got nothing to do with climate change. others to be interjecting like that. Lisa I, remind, order, I remind the member for Dawson that there's been a discussion about relevance about the debate, and I would ask him to refer his remarks to the question before the chair, and for all members to be on their best behaviour because they, could, they have seen what can happen very quickly. The member for Dawson has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker, these people are very relevant to this because these are the people who want to say, and they the have not for so Dawson far. Dawson will not had take on the chair. The chair I'm has not... already been taken on once tonight, and we saw the result of that. The question before the chair is: he can, in consideration in detail about the amendments, he's got plenty of opportunity to relate the remarks of his constituents to those amendments. But this is a debate that he could have had in the second reading. Well, the member for Dawson has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, look, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that uh, the people of this country have not had a say in this. The government does not have a mandate, and what this amendment seeks to do is to give the people a say, to have an election before this tax is adopted. And I've got to tell you, Mr. Speaker, as someone who sat on the carbon tax inquiry, I know that there is a groundswell of support uh, uh, for our proposition here and against this proposal by the government. What I have here under my hand, Mr Speaker, is a rather weighty document. It is actually all of the submissions that were given to the carbon tax inquiry that were knocked back by the carbon tax inquiry. Some 4,500 people who sought to have their say and they were just simply ruled as correspondents only. So the government has form on this. It has form on this by not giving people a say. Well, today they've got two opportunities. One, they can do this. I seek to table this document, Mr. Speaker, and have it included in Hansard. Is leave granted for the tabling of a document? Leave is not granted. A simple Member thing Dawson. like that, Mr. Speaker, rejected, rejected, just goes to show that the government does not want the people of this nation to have their say on the carbon tax. They have no mandate for this, absolutely none at all. 
and I've got plenty more from my electorate uh, that I, like what I've been reading before. People who are outright opposed and say this government does not have a mandate. They should have accepted the tabling of this document, but they don't want to because they don't want the people to have a say. And they should accept this amendment that we are proposing because it gives them a mandate. They currently have none, and they must all sit here very ashamed when they vote tomorrow, knowing deep in their hearts that the Prime Minister said there will be no carbon tax under the government that she leads, the government which is now voting to accept this disgraceful tax against the wishes of the people. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. The question is the amendments be agreed to. The member for Macon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, in speaking to this amendment, I will confine my remarks specifically to the amendment that's been put by the Leader of the Opposition, which seeks to delay the introduction of this legislation. And can I say, as other members on this side have already said, the motive for delaying the introduction of this legislation is simply to ensure that the Australian people don't get to see it in operation, because if they do, it will dispel much of the misinformation and the myths that are being created by members opposite when they speak about this legislation. So it is absolutely in their interest to delay the introduction of the legislation because it enables them to continue to run the fear campaign and the misinformation campaign, which they have been running for the past 12 months and more. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, in speaking to the amendment, can I raise this point as well? And that is that the longer we delay the introduction of any legislation in respect to the impact of greenhouse gas emissions on our climate, the longer the con uncertainty continues in the minds of the business people of Australia. And speakers on the other side have time and time again have come in here and spoken about the concerns that business people have in respect to this legislation. Let me tell um, them that it's my view, and I also speak to business people around the community, that they are equally concerned and have been for now going on to five years that they do not know where they stand in respect to legislation relating to carbon emissions in this country. And whilst that uncertainty hangs over their head, they do not know whether they should plan particular investments, they do not know what direction they shall take, because they simply do not know where they stand in the future when it comes to legislation on this issue. And it is time, after five years, that they did know, because that will enable them to plan with certainty for the future. Can I say, in respect to the comments made by the member for Barawa, and I think he quite rightly pointed out that the two biggest players on this issue in the globe are China and the USA. And he made the point that we should not be acting because, firstly, our emissions, he put it at, at 1 per cent, they're a little bit higher than that, and therefore are irrelevant to the global situation. And he quoted um, a speech from a, a person who I don't recall his name, but he certainly quoted someone making the point that without America and China's involvement, there is no point in, a, in us doing anything. Can I say to the member for Barawa, firstly, in respect to the USA, whilst their national government might not be acting, certainly the state of California is, and the state of California is the eighth biggest economy in the world. It is not inconsequential, it is not insignificant, and so, and, and, and so um, therefore the USA is, uh, is contributing to the global, to the global response on, on this issue. In respect to China, China is investing heavily in replacing old, inefficient coal-fired power stations and also in renewable energy sources, including solar, wind and hydro. And China today has the world's largest installed renewable energy electricity generation capacity. Mr Speaker, China has also, in the last five years, reduced its energy consumption by 19.6 per cent in terms of its per unit of GDP consumption that it produces. It has reduced that by 19.6 per cent in the last five years. That is not, again, insignificant. Furthermore, China has pledged to lower carbon dioxide emissions per unit of GDP by 40 to 45 per cent by the year 2020 compared to 2005 levels. Again, it's quite an ambitious target. And finally, Mr Speaker, China um, has a number of provinces and cities, including Guangdong, Hubei, and the municipalities of Tianjin, Shanghai, Beijing and Zhongqing, which are set to trial an emissions trading scheme in the year 2012. 
Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, those Chinese provinces alone represent a quarter of a billion people, and that's the magnitude of the of the input just in that area alone. Finally, can I say, Mr. Speaker, it's my view that Australia um, should do its fair share in addressing this global issue, and to suggest that just because we produce one percent. It's insignificant in the, in the scheme of things globally. I think is totally, r totally wrong and improper. We should do, at the very minimum, our share to play our part in what is truly a global problem. And quite frankly, that's all this legislation ensures that we do: that we play our part as responsible global citizens in addressing what is indeed a global problem. The question is: the amendments be agreed to? The member for Leichhardt, the Chief Opposition Whip. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I rise to support this amendment, and I, I have to agree with the uh, member for Macon, in so much as we are trying to uh, to delay this vote. We are, in fact, trying to uh, encourage the uh, Prime Minister to show that she has at least a, a, a some level of integrity in relation to in in relation to maintaining a commitment that she made prior to this last election where she said there would, uh, under, and there would be no carbon tax under a government I lead. And of course, we've seen what she's done in relation trash that promise, and uh, here we are finding ourselves as we have denied. I see the member for Dawson with that uh, 4,500 submissions that had been rejected, 4,500 re rejections. There were only 73 submissions that had, uh, that had been accepted. Those 4,500 were, were submissions that said, we do not agree with the government. We do want the opportunity of being able to, uh, to express a point of view and, and have a vote. I actually had a couple of, uh, of those submissions uh, in there somewhere that I have here from my constituents who raised some serious concerns and disappointments. One of them. Uh, that I have here is uh, Evelyn Sally Bain from Bayview Heights in my, er in my electorate, where she's got a single-page submission here where she talks about things such as the tax weakening the Australian economy, the tax won't make even a uh, half of one per cent difference to the international carbon dioxide, be far better for the environment for the government to concentrate on efforts uh, and finances in other areas such as reduction of use of plastics, particularly bottles and bags and, of course, refinancing uh, financing cheap and regular public transport, and, and so she goes on. Quite, a, quite a, uh, uh, a thoughtful submission. Another one here from Bernie Treston, a solicitor uh, in, in my area, and uh, you know, clearly somebody that's put a lot of thought into his submission here, and he again expresses concerns. He's concerned about the mass paperwork the and, uh, and employment of many public servants to try and implement the whole proposed methods of limiting pollution when there are so many cheaper and more effective ways of achieving results and of particular concern. It's likely to increase the cost of production, mainly caused through increasing electricity charges, and they fail to see how they can pass this on to their customers. Mr, Mr. Speaker, both of those submissions were, were rejected. And in their rejection letter, the, the, the committee has stated here, we, only re we receive your emails as correspondence. And while the committee considers the views of that correspondence, it doesn't publish correspondence on its web page. It doesn't lessen the importance. Only documents that are specific detail about the bills were published in those submissions. Now, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have, I have one of these submissions that was actually accepted uh, by, the, uh, by this committee, and it was by Rob Faith. And this is his submission. I am writing to express my support for the government to legislate to put a price on carbon. I urge the government to move ahead with a carbon tax. That was the total extent of his submission. Mm. Whereas you've got no uh, reference to the bill. Sally Baines and, and Bernie oh, Trestrans, of course, have missed out completely. But when we talk about that, of course, there are many others. Fred Ariel and Dennis Cole, of course, Raging Thunder Adventures. They have expressed to me very serious concerns about the impact on their tourism business. And uh, we got uh, Pit Phil uh, Hobbs from Tulsa Dives uh, in Cairns. Already, the tourism industry has done it very, very difficult. And here we have a situation where we have the government now pushing this through, uh, breaking a promise. And all we're saying here in this amendment is let's take it back to the people. Let's hold this over until the, uh, uh, till the uh, 44th Parliament. 
and uh, let the people get an opportunity to have a, a say. Clearly, the fact that these were not accepted, 4,600. I think it is unprecedented that you get that amount reject rejecting this government's, uh, uh, go government submission that we should have a, ta a, 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 a carbon tax. And in fact, of all the submissions, they could only find something like 73 that actually agreed with them, and they're the only ones that they were prepared to accept. It is just absolutely outrageous that the government is continuing to push this through. I can tell you now there are many people on the other side that in the 44th parliament we won't be seeing them around. I can guarantee you that. The outrage in my community of Leichhardt and many other areas that are everywhere I go, that it is absolutely disgusted by the antics of this. They certainly don't accept uh, the preposition that has been put forward Order. by this government. They totally Order. reject the it and they demand a vote. Expired. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The member for Chifley. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Uh, the effect of the amendment that's being put forward by the opposition is, as has been reflected and has been admitted by their side, um, to, uh, in effect, delay any action on climate change. And part of the defence is that, uh, in actual fact, others aren't uh, moving on this issue and therefore we shouldn't. Um, but, uh, quite frankly, we are not leading the world and in the biggest danger for us is we are in danger of being left behind. The rest of the world clearly is acting and both our economy and environment are at risk through delay. Most countries, many countries, all the major emitters are acting now to reduce carbon pollution and a broad range of countries have introduced or are planning market-based emissions, trading schemes and carbon taxes. And it's worth noting top five trading partners, China, Japan, US, Republic of Korea, India, and another six of our top 20 trading partners, New Zealand, UK, Germany, Italy, France, Netherlands, have implemented or are piloting carbon trading or taxation systems at a national, state or city level. And many of those countries um, have renewable energy targets, including uh, 14 of Australia's top 20 trading partners. Now we're being asked to delay action when in actual fact the pace for, of change that is occurring beyond our borders is speeding up. 89 countries accounting for over 80 per cent of global carbon pollution and over 90 per cent of the global economy have pledged to reduce or limit pollution by 2020 under the United Nations, under the United Nations framework on convention of, on climate change. ETSs operating for years in 31 European countries, New Zealand and in 10 US states, and California, the world's eighth largest economy, world's eighth largest, largest economy, has legislated for an ETS. Again, we are being asked not to do anything when there are many countries and many parts of the US that are already moving on this. And in addition to regional cap and trade measures, at the national level, the US is, is basically implementing a number, a diverse range of actions to reduce carbon pollution, including environmental regulation, renewable energy targets, transport sector initiatives. All this work happening. China, referenced before in the debate, ambitious targets to reduce uh, its uh, economy's energy and, and carbon intensity. And by 2013, it's planning to pilot emissions trading in several major provinces and cities, including Beijing and Shanghai, combined population this is worth noting, of over 200 million people, a combined GDP significantly larger than Australia's. So it's obvious that the world is moving on this, and the danger for us is we are left behind as they move ahead. And as I indicated earlier in the debate, we are forced to play expensive catch-up, where every year where we don't undertake any action, we are required to stump up Five billion extra to help get us closer to the 5 per cent emission reduction target by 2020. I've noticed in this debate a reference to democracy, and I've noticed a reference to people not being given a say. Well, I think if we are going to uh, uh, talk about people having a say, there's one member of the entire front bench of 21 MPs that has not spoken against the carbon price. He's the only member of the entire shadow ministry, including all of the parliamentary secretaries—27 members hasn't spoken. He's only one of five MPs out of 72 coalition MPs not to speak against the carbon price, and only one of three MPs of the 70 that's been present for the whole debate and chosen not to speak. 
and that person is the member for Wentworth. So if you're going to tell us and come in here and bring all these petitions and all these statements and start quoting people who have been denied a say, look at your own side where there is clearly a division, particularly among senior people who believe that action does need to be taken, and it's not. And significantly, we've had some references, and I had to sit in the chamber earlier listening to people who believe that they've been gagged. Let's go to the stats. Those opposite gagged 26 Labor MPs during Telstra privatisation. I represented the union that was part of that organisation, where jobs went from 90,000 to 30,000 through the course of privatisation. All those people lost their jobs and their livelihood. 26 uh, Labor MPs gagged right, during that privatisation. And, reopen the second and 20, debate, and 20 Labor chiefly. MPs gagged on work choices. If we're going to have people say, talking about democracy, look first at your own record before you start lecturing us. The member for Hasluck. Mr Speaker, I rise to speak on the uh, amendment for the delay of the proclamation of the legislation. I do so on a couple of grounds. One is the issue that the member for Chifley raises, and that is the construct of democracy. Because I thought with the new paradigm that we would be doing business very differently in the way that we would debate legislation in this House, that we would have much more open uh, processes that would enable us to deal with some of the complexities, particularly of this legislation. And I'm glad that the member there is interjecting, but let me share with you. In a shocking and historically unprecedented suppression of political expression, 4,500 Australians opposed to the carbon tax have had their submissions to the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Clean Energy Future legislation rejected out of hand. Upon its establishment, the Joint Select Committee called for submissions from Australians on the legislation to impose a carbon tax, despite giving Australians only one week to wade through over 1,000 pages of legislation, the committee website specifically stated that it encourages submissions to its inquiries from a wide range of individuals and organisations, and yet only 73 submissions, mainly in favour of carbon tax, were accepted by the committee, with 4,500 rejected out of hand. Never in the history of the Australian Parliament has such a wide-scale rejection of opinions taken place. Never before have submissions been rejected in such a manner. This is hubris to the highest order. It was also interesting, looking in today's West Australian, on page 8, a full-page advert by the Australian Trade and Industry Alliance. And I will cite these words because these words were words that were conveyed to myself and to the Shadow Minister when we met with many small businesses and groups within Hasluck. The words are, if, car if a carbon tax passes parliament higher prices that could do nothing for climate change become law, the government is introducing the world's largest carbon tax legislation in parliament this week, and if the world's largest carbon tax becomes law, it effectively means higher prices will also become law. It will be the law for higher fuel prices for 60,000 businesses. It will be the law for higher electricity prices for every Australian family and business. It will be the law for higher public transport costs. It will be the law that raises costs for Australian manufacturers. Let me say that in my electorate, constituents have openly expressed their sense of betrayal and have made strong comments in the condemnation of a commitment that was given not to introduce a carbon tax but in fact have found that this government is introducing carbon tax that will impact on them. Businesses have indicated that they, will be, they have been direct in their opposition because they have been considering the flow-on cascading effect of costs. For Western Australia, let me take the example of food supply. It tends to emanate out of the southeastern corner of this country. Significant costs will be derived from the cost of an increase in fuel and then transporting that across the country. In talking with truckies, they say to me that it costs them $3,000 minimum. And if they go further from Perth to Kununurra, then the cost is uh, 
is again the same. In my electorate, there are people who currently make decisions about whether they go without medication to put food on a table. They find that the increasing costs are impacting on their quality of life and their choice of life for themselves and their children. Any other increases that are additional to what they ex experience at the moment will only be an added burden. And it'll be a pity to see that people who will go without are those in greatest need, even those on Centrelink will have to bear the cost of the increases that will come. Yet I'm sure that there are many in this House who will never go hungry, nor never want, nor never need a comfortable bed. And yet there will be others within my electorate and many others who will experience poverty, who will experience the challenges of meeting the costs of living, and in that context will not be able to give their families and children the quality of life that they've always dreamt of and aspired to. And those seeking to own homes will have the additional burden of that tax. I feel for those who will have the greatest impact. Order. Order. The Honourable Member has expired. The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. In the minute or so's time that is left before the House adjourns uh, before tomorrow, I'd just like to thank members for their contribution during the consideration in detail phase of the debate over the bills. Uh, it's spanned the better part of six hours and traversed quite a number of issues, and I do thank members for their contribution. I'd like to take the opportunity too to thank my friend and colleague, the member for Isaacs, the parliamentary secretary for <coughs> excuse me, climate change and energy efficiency, for all of the work uh, that he has done over the last 12 months to contribute to the development of this policy and this legislation and all of the support uh, that he has given me. I'm tremendously grateful for that. And finally, I'd just uh, confirm that in relation to the amendments that uh, have been moved, the amendment by the Leader of the Opposition, uh, there is no case in the government's view for delay of this important reform. It will be environmentally effective, it will be economically efficient and it will be socially equitable and the country does need to make this reform. We also do not support, we also do not support the amendment that was moved by uh, the member for O'Connor and I would Order. finally commend the government's amendments to Order. the House. It being 11 p.m. the debate is interrupted in accordance with the resolution agreed to this sitting and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The House stands adjourned until 9am tomorrow.